Thank you for, very much. I'm also sorry about that. My condolence to the family. As Tony Blair said, we should be tough on crime and tough on the causes of crime. So we have four pillars. First of all, we need to hire 250 new officers. There is a shortage of officers right now, and we have to go up, uh, up to the roof, which is 4,800. And if we need to do more, we'll do more. Modernize. We need to bring, we, we will bring the SPVM into the 21st century with new uh, innovative practice, such as implementing body cams for our officers. We need to prevent, because as uh, the mayor said, and I agree, we need to have a community approach. Uh, so we will have to work with, with them, and, but you know, kind of have a social agenda attached to it. And restrain by elabor uh, elaborating a pan-Canadian municipal plan because it's, it's all the cities who are suffering that at the same time. Mr. Coderre, thank you. Mr. Holness. Firstly, condolences to the family. Um, I hear the pain in their voices. And there are hundreds and thousands of Canadians, Quebecers and Montrealers, young people in particular that don't have a future. They're dropping out of school. They don't have the leisure, sports and recreation infrastructure to really allow themselves to flourish in society. They don't have adequate job training. And for centuries, we've continuously invested in our police forces. We're not taking the concrete measures to start investing in health and social services and mental health. And that's the result we're seeing today. I am offering a new approach for Montreal, where communities come first where communities are the priority, and we start investing in families, in youth, and in and around schools. Right now, the epicenter of COVID-19 is also the epicenter of violence. These are boroughs that have been underfunded for decades, and it's time to have a new Montreal with a new party and a new mayor. All right, I'm just going to remind you that uh, when you do have your one minute, I would ask you to address the specific question Absolutely. and try to stay on topic, okay? Mm -hmm. So we continue in this theme of public security. Um, in this open debate now, I want to dig a little deeper into how to curb this violence. There's been a lot of debate about funding or defunding the police. You've all brought it up. It's all in response to the gun violence as well as femicide in the city, but less about how to stop and prevent these crimes before they actually happen. So what support and what funding would you provide for prevention for both? And Mr. Holness, you can start on that. Well, to prevent crime, we have to start giving young people an opportunity. We have to unblock their futures. Right now, the epicenter of violence are in boroughs that are actually governed by Mr. Kader. Young people are dropping out of school. They have no hope. They have no support. We have to start investing in health and social services, and we have to ensure that the SPVM is accountable. Right now, 40% of all tickets go to homeless people. So we are policing poverty with $800 million. What we need to do is a better job of reallocating funds to help young people, to help those who are homeless, and help those who are the most vulnerable. And Mr. Kuder. We are the only party who, is against, who are against defunding and disarming. I think that we can, we can, we can do both. Like, we can prevent, we can have a provincial agenda, but we need to have a strong presence of the police force at the same time. In Montreal North, we had, for example, some, uh, some basketball with the, with the police force, with the kids. Of course, we have to go to the source. That's why, and I agree, that we have to go to the source. But we cannot say we, we'll take out some money for the others. We can do both at the same time. So this is an ecosystem where you need a social agenda, but at the same time, you, you need to secure the area and fight a, a strong fight against crime. Well, because it was a very concrete question, I think we need to come up with you know, numbers and exactly what we're going to accomplish. So not only do we have to have a balanced approach when it comes to poli pol pol policing and the community groups working together, but it's about infrastructure. So our party, not only have we created more fields for different sports, whatever it's the uh, Aqua Centre, for example, in Montreal now, we're doing one in Rosemont right now, more access to public library. And let's say that during the COVID, we realized how it was difficult for fa many families to even have some room, some space within their own home. And when we talk about systemic barriers to have fully access to a job or, or, or some opportunities, it's related to housing, it's related to infrastructure, and it's related to what is the quality of life? Do you have, do you have uh, parks in your neighborhood? Can you have easily access to a, a library or something else? So for me, all that has to be very concrete because those are concrete issues. So let's talk about the numbers. Um, the mayor increased the budget to the SPVM and said that it was at the rate of inflation. 
And it wasn't true. It was actually double. Um, when it became popular to fund policing, she said, yes, I did increase the funding. So there's some double talk there. Also, there was $100 million additional invested in the police, which the mayor put very, very little into community groups. It, thinks, it seems as though uh, the mayor only figured out she was the mayor of Montreal only last year. In her first, first year, $1 million. Second year, $2 million. So the mayor has underfunded and definanced, actually, young people and community groups and put $3 million towards basketball and $800 million but towards... But what is your plan, Mr. Holness? So, because you can talk as much you. as you want about me, but what is your cost? What is your, your plan looks like? That's what, about defunding. How much are you going to take from the SPVM and put it into something else? We want to know. Thank you so much for the question. We have a $1 billion plan to invest in health and social services, as well as sports, leisure, and recreation infrastructure. Right now, there's $550 million going towards salaries. We think that should be more on lines of $450 million. And we want to ensure that the hierarchy of the SPVM is less about management and connect the top to the people on the ground. That's about a $100 million reallocation. You Currently, cur last point, Currently, the mayor invested $140 million in social housing while police officers are policing young people and homeless people to the rate of 40% of all tickets go to homeless people. Those are the numbers, and numbers don't lie. I think, I think we're missing a lot of things here. I'm thinking about the moms and the dads who are afraid because they don't want to leave their kids to go to the park because of the situation. So we have to, we can't talk about numbers and all that, but there is insecurity right now. And uh, sorry, but the current administration just saw the light three months before the election because Thank for you. three years there, were, there was less police than uh, in 2017. So we need, first of all, to bring back the trust of our police force because they are, they are key. At the same time, yes, there is some issues of racial profiling and systemic racism, and it's all about training, but it's not saying that police is just for repression, for example, and, this, and the, all the social and the community base is something else. Everybody is working at the front line together, and we have a budget, for God's sake, of $7 billion now projected, so we have the money for so, both. So we need to I invest please? more Ms. in Ms. the police Plank, and ahead, the social. Thank you very much. Um, you know, we went through a, a COVID, we went through a pandemic, it's not even over. And in the last 18 months, police officers were busy, mostly having to deal with a curfew. That's what they were doing, and we were all at home trying to find some peace. I'm very, I'm very proud that uh, in last November, when the chief of police came to me and asked and said, you know, Madame Maire, for, we need to put some resources because there, we expect there's going to be more um, violence, in, including guns. We, put, we decided to put together ELTA. And since January, it's 450 guns that we took out of the street. So I just want to say, first of all, that I want to thank all the SPVM, all the police officers, all the community groups that went through the COVID supporting the families and supporting the communities. And I'm glad that we were together to do that because when we talk about public security, when, come, when the crisis arrives, you need to stand up, you need to make sure that everybody is safe and, and to leave no one behind. So, and we did, we did also talk, we were, t we're talking generally right now about gun violence, but I do want to bring you back to femicide as well, mm -hmm. because yeah, that yeah. is an issue mm -hmm. that we're Well, I think that well, this is ahead, an important issue because uh, safety has uh, different angles, but it's about people and to make them safe. And uh, when the worst happens, we need to, to, to help them, to, to follow them so they can get out of that situation and feel safe. So there are some tangible st thing like transport, bring their goods with them and make sure that uh, you know, they don't have to look at their pocket or looking for a taxi. We need to help them to work at that level. But we need to provide at the same time the proper environment because prevention is key at the same time. Yeah, and, and we, we agree on that point, and that's why we have in our platform at Montreal to start investing in housing, and particularly female-led housing. Right now, we want to ensure that any woman who is in a situation that's precarious has the help that they need, investing in community organizations, but also the housing crisis has a derivative impact on the situation because they need a place to go to feel safe. Right now, there's only 1,200 social housing units built, we need to do a better job to provide uh, social housing for women-led households in order for them to be able to get out of these situations. And last but not least, community organizations, and this goes back to the SPVM generally, 
are underfunded. We need to do have a better job and think more holistically about public security. Mr. Holmes, I'm going to have to yeah. let yes. Ms. Your Hunt question in, also because you said, how do yeah. we uh, prevent homicides? And for us, it's, the solution is also, it's definitely not about defunding. That is not an option. And the only party who did defund was the Nicaragua during the right now. Yeah, but the for question. the uh, neighborhood, the instinct needs to be stronger. So what we're working with the SPVM is to make sure that police officers stays in the same neighborhood for a longer, at least three years, five years would be ideal because this connection, this comprehension, th this, this way of knowing what's going on is so precious and can prevent so many, many accidents, not accidents, but more incidents and homicides the as well. The problem is you had four years to do it and now three months later you see the light. Even the president of the union is saying that I saw the mayor just, just in, in June. The reality is that you are for defunding police. The same thing with Palermo. It's okay. I respect that school You're of the thought, one who did the but defunding, we are the Mr. only Kada. one who believe in, in funding. And I spoke to the police force and they, they are, they are, they are uh, tired. And uh, we need to have more mixed squadron, for example, regarding feminicide. They, they are at the front line. They are social actors at the same time. But we need also at the same time to give money to community bases and help them. So we are about mixed squadrons. We are about helping community organizations better training for police, de-escalation. But the culture to take away from this conversation is that there is an archaic way of thinking about public security. We think about it more as a housing environment, health and social services, interventions, education, support. That's how we view it. There is this idea that we can invest in firearms and police to solve these crimes, and that is not the correct solution. We have a more compassionate, inclusive, and peaceful way of solving crimes at Movement Montreal. All right, well, that wraps up public safety for now. Mitsumi, on to the next topic. Thanks, Deborah. Montreal is diverse, linguistically, racially, culturally. The idea of inclusion is critical if we're all going to work and live together. One issue that's come to divide linguistic communities is Bill 96, Quebec's revision of the French language charter. Alicia? Bill 96 is, of course, a provincial law, but its effects will be wide-ranging, including at the municipal level. Pietro Bucci of Rivière-des-Prairies wants to know how you will protect the rights of Anglophones in Montreal. Thank you. My question is, Bill 96 will remove some of the rights of Anglophones in Montreal. So if you support Bill 96, how can you claim you want to provide services to both linguistic communities? How can you say you support the rights of English speakers, yet support taking some of those rights away? Thank you, Mr. Bucci. So we start with Mr. Cadet. You've got one minute to respond. Grazie, Pietro, per la, per la question. <coughs> Let me be clear. Montreal is a francophone city consisting of a diverse cultural mosaic, including a vibrant Anglophone community. They all deserve to have services, and we are going to provide it to them. As a service provider, our focus and commitment are to continue servicing our population. This is self-evident for matters including 311, public safety, security, and public health related services. I am going to be the mayor of unity and the best ally to implement the principles of living together. Linguistic peace is vital for me, whether as mayor, an MP, or as a minister of Canada. While I agree with the objective of the law to promote and protect the French languages, as a local government to English and other linguistic communities, the question of applicability is key. We need a common sense approach, and my duty as mayor of Montreal is to ensure that the Quebec government understands our need to serve our English community. Thank you very much, Mr. Cadet. Mr. Holmes, you have one minute. Montreal is a multicultural, multilingual metropolis. It is the most beautiful city in the world with over 200 cultural communities. Montreal is unique. We need to ensure that we build a home for all Montrealers where you could really feel a sense of security and that you can get any job that you want, any opportunity that you like. We want to recognize Montreal for what it is, a multicultural, multilingual metropolis. I am the only candidate on this stage that supports that ideology and rejects Bill 21 and Bill 96. We will not be in any way, shape or form upholding that law. And we are going to ensure that all businesses, all Montrealers will be able to have services to do business in the language of the choice, particularly in English or in French. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Holmes. Ms. Blunt. Yes, uh, thank you. So, of course, this is a very passionate uh, debate. I understand why, because uh, a language is, of course, words, but it's, it's also a, an open window to a culture. And so I understand that some people are worried about how they will be recognized, about their rights, about their contribution to this city. So for me, uh, you know, I've been saying the same thing whatever I'm talking to Anglophone or Francophone. My position has always, always been clear. I support Bill 96. But I went into commission while in campaign to promote and to share my thoughts and our, our expectation here in Montreal to have, for example, the 311 out of, uh, the, on the list of exclusion because we want to make sure that every Montrealers, whatever language they talk, whatever, whoever they are, they need to have the, the services they deserve. That's what a city does first is giving services. So for me, we can valorize the language. French should be a glue. But for sure, we need to also protect the uh, rights of Anglophone, but also of the uh, uh, indigenous people. Thank you very much, Ms. Plant. We're going to open it up now to an open debate. A recent report found systemic racism against black, blue collar workers in Montreal North. They were targeted for discrimination. They were given the worst shifts. What will you do to make sure the cultural communities are represented in all the departments, fire department, the blue collar workers, the police, to, to hire them and to make these people feel welcome after they've been hired. Mr. Cadell, we start with Well, that, that's a key issue, to be representative. Uh, I think it starts also politically when we have, uh, like in our party, we, we, we don't study the, the diversity, we are diversity. We, we understand that. We need to have, of course, regarding uh, all the services to have the people who, uh, who feel that they, they can have a say and so we need to be more representative uh, at the decision making process but also we spoke about firemen it's a bit uh, difficult at that level uh, I, I understand also regarding the police force and different uh, civil servant of uh, different uh, different services so we need to do more and but the thing it's not just internally we need to open it of course we have to talk with the unions but we need to open more the fact and uh, it will be pretty helpful. The other point, uh, well, lastly, can, is when we have commissioners say, that's, or yeah, appointments. That's not like a monologue. We can, <laughs> with appointment, we can have the people yeah. from okay, uh, Plank, other. Yeah. Um, well, again, it was a concrete question. So I think what you want to know is who has targets and how it's going to work. So uh, during uh, the last four years, we have put together uh, a very strong plan about uh, the hiring process and how do we make sure that people that gets into the city force, how do they maneuver, they go up the scale. So for the entire, for, uh, for the city of Montreal, the objective is to have 33% of uh, uh, visible and ethnic um, uh, people working within the workforce, uh, the city force. That is very, very crucial. But around that, there's the hiring, but then there's the mentorship and all the programs. Also, the fact that we were the first administration that brought uh, in Canada to have a bureau for the systemic and uh, racist, uh, systemic racism and discrimination, sorry. Uh, is very strong because now we have a commissioner and she helps us yeah. to go through all everything to see what processes can be better addressed what needs to be done in order to attract and to keep of course people from the div yeah. diversity but also and with women like it worked before something, uh, sorry, thank you there's something about this um this election and this candidacy um that we need to have some honesty in this situation uh the mayor didn't say that it required 22,000 signatures, 300 community groups to force the mayor to recognize systemic racism. That's step one. Uh, the mayor did not want to recognize it. It took three and a half years. Also, all of the individuals who were hired in management positions during the mayor's tenure were homogenous. And the reason why we had this public consultation on systemic racism in the first place is because your team reflected systemic racism. So there's only one person on this stage that is going to not just provide the 28,000 employees of the city of Montreal with equal opportunity, but the 2.1 million Montrealers, whether it's the Bangladesh community, the Syrian community, wherever, wherever you're from, you're going to have equal opportunity under a homeless administration. And I pledge that this metropolis, our GDP, will double in the next 20 years if we actually untap the ethnocultural power that we have in the city. And under these two candidates, 
systemic racism and barriers will remain. They have not changed for decades, and they were actually exacerbated by both of your candidacies and both of your administrations. But I think, First you know, everybody who's watching right now yeah. have heard the promises. We've all agreed that there's a problem that, that we must do better. Mm -hmm. Just take racial profiling mm -hmm. in the police force. We all agree it's there, it has to be stopped. But we keep hearing the promises and the reports. Because you have the so same when? people running. Right no, now there's when? a new administration. But how? but how do you guarantee? Is it going to stop once and for all? You First need to have representation. So, Valerama, you just spoke, yeah, if I may, because I want to salute him for, for the, uh, the, the, the movement that he created when he went to a CPM and all that. That was great. But Montreal was there was also before. We can have some approach, and we had some uh, uh, approach when, when we were there. And, uh, you know, I, I, so I, understand, I understand racial profiling. I understand all approaches? that. We were there even, you know, we've been fighting against uh, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, any form of intolerance. We, we've been raising the approach is to make sure that there's an inclusive decision-making process. Secondly, we need to change the approach, the cultural approach. I mean, we have to change some mentalities, but it takes some time. And I see that uh, at different services, they are working pretty hard. And in, in my time, I even have uh, high level uh, decision makers who, who represent the Asian community and some others. Yes. But we, this need, is called we need tokenism to do more. And instrumentalization. It's an ongoing issue that what, we have to do. Right now, under both of these administrations, indigenous women were 11 times more likely to be stopped by police officers. Black and Arab were four to five times more likely. We need better training for police officers. We need to reform of that deontologie policière to ensure there's true accountability when police officers do commit these, these crimes, excuse me. And without representation, you're not going to have recognition. Under both administrations, we are recognizing it, but there are no actions taken. The borough of the commissioner that the mayor speaks of has yet to do a single thing since their mandate began. Ms. Plant? You know, when we talk about this issue, which is also very important, I don't think no one is looking at us right now saying, like, who's the messiah of, you know, who's going to make change everything by magic. It doesn't work yeah, that way. True. I think that we're all committed in different ways. We have, and I'm not going to go into approaches because I'm about just giving, like, concrete uh, examples to people. But ultimately, ultimately, what it's, uh, when you have a, uh, an action plan, when... When you, you decide as mayor to recognize this, uh, discrimination and racism, it's no detail. No other you know, cities have done that. When you put the efforts and you create a bureau and you put the people there, it's huge. And they're working with other organizations, the SPVM. They're working with the STM. To me, this is very strong. Does it take time? Yes. But we have to move as fast as we can because we know that some people are scared or feel like they're not you know, they don't, they don't have the same right because of the color of their skin or their gender or their sexual orientation. So this is true. But at the same time, we need to recognize everything that has been done in the past. And how can we even fast forward all those changes, of for, course? For okay, all so the cultural got, communities. I, I, we've got, a, excuse me, just for a yes. second. We've got about two and a half minutes left. Yes. And I want to ask all three of you very quickly this. S whenever one of you is elected mayor, the next time after your mandate begins and one person is pulled over by the police because of racial profiling, what will you do? You have to reform la deontologie policière and ensure that the member of the executive committee responsible for the 38 recommendations, particularly recommendation 37, it gets enacted and that you continuously fund the borough of the commissioner that fights for systemic racism, which is Bashra Manai. Can okay. I say, yes. you make, you do, you make the STM, the SPVM, everybody in the city accountable. And for that, you need to have more transparency, whatever is through body cam or whatever is by the, the you check police. You can't say body cameras. You the voted against police. body cameras for can, the last four can, years. Can I please end my but, phrase, yes, please, Mr. Yes, but don't lie Holmes. to the public. We're on so national the, TV here. To do the street check. So those are mechanisms that we're putting in place to bring more transparency. And that is, that is crucial. The reality is that... The current administration did, did have that leadership, and they, there was no presence. We started the reconciliation process with indigenous people, for example. We said we had a four pillars regarding safety, and we talk about prevention. So 
the, the living together approach is to have a balanced approach between openness and vigilance. We need a vigilance agenda. We need to have more people accountable. We need to change the training, but we need to have some inclusive strategy at the decision-making process. And by having, for example, the director of SPVM also uh, a deputy uh, general manager, you will be part of all the decision-making. There will be both sensitive way to uh, make an, an answer to those issues. Okay, you've got, we've got 20 seconds left. Perfect. Authenticity, honesty, transparency for everyone listening at home. Think to yourself, who is going to be the person that's going to advance inclusion, diversity, and togetherness in Montreal? And that's Movement Montreal. Okay, we will now move on. Thank you very much. On to the climate crisis now. From extreme heat in the summer to icy winters, Montrealers are living the effects of the climate crisis. Many voters feel the urgency and want action. Over to Alicia now with a question about that. Joachim Legarec lives near the water in Cartierville. He wants to know what can be done to mitigate the effects of spring flooding. Good evening. In 2017 and 2019, the whole neighborhood of Montreal have been hit by major flooding. The reality of climate change means that not only those events will be more frequent, but they will also be more intense. What are your plans to address the legitimate anxiety of citizens, as this is a question of safety, financial impact, and mental health for us all? Mr. Le Garek, uh, thank you very much for your question. Candidates, you now have a minute each to respond. Mr. Holness, you'll start this off. So this is a large concern right now in Il Bizal, Saint Geneviève, as well as Pierrefonds, Roxborough. Uh, there have been significant floods that caused a lot of damage. And right now, as a metropolis, we are not doing enough to curb greenhouse gases, and that's really inconsistent with a sustainable future for all Montrealers. We need to do a better job to electrify our public transportation. And that, to, to do it for the whole city, is around $6 billion. That includes the STM, police, as well as ambulances, and territorial disparities. We need to do a better job of creating more green spaces throughout the island, particularly in low-income neighborhoods. And more importantly, we need a firm and ambitious action plan for whether it's a heat wave, a flood, or anything else that we can actually intervene and solve the crisis when it happens. Right, Ms. Plant, you have a minute now to talk about flooding. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we, we know I was the mayor when we went through two of those uh, flooding, and it was, I definitely want to thank all the uh, public security services that were there supporting uh, the families and uh, the people living in the west part of the island. So uh, to protect, to protect, uh, to prevent, sorry, those, uh, those events, what we need to do is to protect the shores. Very important. We also have to save as many Greenlands as possible. This is why we decided to create the Grand Parc de l'Ouest. It was a way to make sure that we wouldn't develop on the remaining green uh, for uh, lands over there and to make sure because they act like a sponge. So when we create, uh, we decide to, to build on different spots, spots we need to have in mind. Is it going to contribute to the problem, especially in areas like that? So specifically about it, this is what we're seeing. And for the rest, we have this uh, amazing uh, uh, climate plan that we work with uh, experts and the economic sector. And I will be happy to share more about that because there has to be a solution for every sector. We're going to talk more about yes. that for sure. Thank you, Ms. Plant. <laughs> Mr. Coderre. Thank you, Deborah. I, I've been living myself also the flood. And I want to pay tribute to Jim Bays and all the gang from Roxborough, uh, Pierre von Roxborough, uh, Fiji. I knew at that time, Arut uh, that uh, and I met Mr. Uh, Legarek, and I, I, I know how you feel. We need a resilience agenda. The resilience agenda is the way that we should you know, react to that situation. And uh, I have to say that the current administration has an issue because uh, Jim was left alone a bit. But at the second time, it's, it's broader than that. It's what are we going to do about the greenhouse uh, uh, impact, the emission. We need, we need to protect. Uh, and uh, I salute because I agree with the, the Parc de l'Ouest. Uh, we've done that with Meadowbrook, and we had some other area. We need to, uh, to plant more trees, but uh, in some area to fight against the heat islands. And uh, it, will have a, it will have an impact on all, but it's everybody's business, and everybody here, I would suggest, are, sens are sensitive about that issue. 
Yeah, between the disastrous floods, of course, we had the deadly heat wave. Mm -hmm. 66 people died during the summer of 2018. Beyond planting more trees in the city to reduce the impact of heat li islands, uh, what is your single most bold promise to tackle greenhouse gases in our city? We're going to open this up to a debate. Ms. Plant, you're going to start this segment off, <coughs> and Sorry. I just invite you to yeah. jump in as we okay. continue to... Sure. Well, definitely planting more trees. Uh, there's areas in Montreal, especially downtown, where there's uh, so many heat islands. So we need to uh, uh, have more, plant more trees. So in our plan, we have 500,000 trees to be planted. And we know exactly where we will be putting them because it's obvious we have parks, but there's new areas as well. And as for uh, when we talk about reducing our emission, the key area is transportation. That's why we're putting so much effort into the electrification of public transport, Having more projects like the pink line, the blue line, uh, the SRB Pinot, there has to be a strong will into reducing the, our, our emission. And the second area where it's very strong is construction. So we have put money to support individuals who would like to redo their home but to have more uh, er environmental resilience. So very specific incentive to support families, Montrealers who want to do their part. So whether it's, uh, and, and we agree on this, the environment, uh, we, we all care about it. One of the issues that we see is that there are bold plans that are put forth, but we don't have the money to pay for them. So to get green spaces, you have to purchase the land. You have to reserve the land. Uh, to get electric buses, this costs money. Uh, we have to start recognizing territorial disparities. So low income areas have less access to green spaces. From our research team, we saw that it's more like a $6 billion plan to really curb our emissions by 2030, which is critical. And as we all know, over the last 24 years, Canada has never met a target, in particular the Paris Accord. So why do we ask for state-like status or to get more power and more money? Because if we are going to truly meet our targets, we are going to need around $6 billion to ensure the electrification of our public transportation, to ensure we plant enough trees. And right now, I love the plan. I've seen the plan, but there's no money behind it. And that's why we have not seen the ecological footprint of the city of Montreal go down over the last four years. Minus the pandemic, we have not seen any advancements in regards to greenhouse well, gas emissions in Montreal. Well, in, in our team, we are going to be carbon neutral by 2045, and yes, we have a plan. I think we need, and we spoke a lot about money, we need to have new eco-fiscal policies, and we, and we have to find other ways to, to get money. Because usually when we're working with other level government, we are asking to uh, put at the level what we already have. So we need new money to develop. So we, have, uh, we want to bring up the, uh, the idea of green bonds. The green bonds will have an impact, a direct impact, not only on development, to make sure that we can green the place. It's not a matter to have 500,000 trees. It's a matter where you're going to plant it. And in our case, we believe there's no street without, without trees. We have to work on that. There's certain area and has, there's impact and inequity because of the uh, See, of, uh, I, I, I the find it interesting because both of you are talking about the climate crisis, saying, yeah, we need to go get money somewhere else, where we can actually act here. And there's money reserved whatever it's through the climate budget or the housing budget, because when we have put money aside to actually buy land to transform it into parks, that's what, how we did it with the Grand Parc de l'Ouest. So I'm not going to wait for other level of government to solve the problem here in Montreal. I want to be the leader. I want to find the solutions. And then, you know, of course, when we talk about electrification, for example, but, well, not buses, but a, a metro line, of course, we need the help of other level of government. But when, once, when we want, if we want to reduce the clothes uh, wasting or food wasting, I'm not going to wait for other levels. We can do it ourselves. This is how we decided to buy, ban uh, single-use plastic. And we didn't wait for Ottawa or for Quebec. Years. We can do it ourselves. You, no, you it's next year. It's so next year, exactly. I'm so you happy because all I'm before. saying <laughs> is the exactly. leadership like is right now in Montreal. Odd. And we were being recognized around the world. And I was at the United Nations representing Montreal because we are now the leader in North America. So, Madame Plant, we, we've, we we've been in, I, in I politics you before just 2017. Spoke, though, okay, and I'll, sorry, Valerie. Okay. I mean, we, we, the reason why 
you are able to have that kind of money is because we had the status of metropolis in 2017. And uh, you still have some fights because you, you approach with the park and it's a good idea, but uh, it's not settled and you ask money from Ottawa to end. Okay, we're talking a lot about money. I, I did just bring up the point though in my question, what's the bold thing that you're going to do for the city? And uh, in terms of the environment, in terms and of cutting down greenhouse gases, just really, really quickly, sure. a rough yes. file, okay? Yes. Yeah. The Public Consultation Office recommendation 31 spoke about territorial disparities. Heat islands are critical. You mentioned it. 66 people passed away in 2018. It's not always about these bold, big ideas. The compound the West, no one has access to it. No one has ever been to it. But sometimes it's about. Idea. Sometimes it's about. Excuse me. <laughs> sometimes it's about helping communities, building parks in these locations, ensuring people have access to water, to uh, air conditioning. Those are the things that's going to help us in this um, pandemic, post-pandemic, and in, in this environmental crisis. I would suggest food safety. I suggest to, to make sure that because uh, the, the, there's a lot of waste that we have to take care of, protect our own resources. We've done doing that and it's going on about protecting our water and the way the leaks and all that. We need uh, more access, you're right. It's not just to have built parks, but take care of, of the parks that already exist. And I would suggest, we spoke a lot about transport. We believe, of course, in electrification, but uh, in the delivery, the way that you delivery, uh, you know, to have kind of a truck strategy and make sure that you don't have trucks and too much transport at the same time. Since it was a concrete question, I think we had to I answer we with two words. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's two kind things, of a, a it's going to be the, uh, the, the okay. carbon the carbon neutral uh, downtown area uh, that's moving forward and finally the hyperdrome which will be an eco uh, eco neighborhood and that is also very strong because we're going to have 7500 people living in a place where it will be carbon neutral you know okay we just have uh, we have two, yeah, and, and, you two know and a half minutes i, I want to get one quick question in uh, because we were talking about uh, attaining zero waste in 2030 and let's talk about waste you know yeah. <laughs> there's an awful lot of waste that happens food in the waste city. Yeah. food waste uh, whether it ends up in Clothing. our landfills we've got yeah. garbage waste we've got water waste <laughs> would you be willing yeah. to put a tax on that not immediately. Uh, the public constitution office would need to consult with this. We'd have to consult with experts before talking about taxing that. Right now, one of my large concerns is that we're building these high-rise condos that do not have proper recycling, do not have proper composting. I think we could be innovative and assist people and, in that transition before taxing them uh, in that regard. One Thank minute you. each. Well, Mr. Listen, we put We put the waste management strategy with Real Menard at that time, and it's an ongoing, it's an, it's, it's an ongoing issue. So, of would course... You tax, would you tax waste? That, but I spoke about eco-fiscal uh, policies. That's exactly it. When we had four years ago, we had a group about reducing the non-residential taxation, and the next step is to be responsible uh, through uh, fiscality uh, and, and the ecosystem. And now some people saw the light four years ago, but uh, we had four years to do it and uh, nothing happened. So we, we, we need to change and to diversify our way of, of uh, having revenues, but we need to make sure that everybody is responsible. Exactly the same thing with the, par the parking. We will implement the tax if they're not eco-responsible. If they are, we'll take it off, but we need to make sure that everybody is doing their share. Ms. Plant. Yes, I have to say, I find it very interesting that uh, both of you keep saying that we didn't go fast enough, but when you have a, a minute, especially you, Mr. Holness, you say, no, no, I will consult. Yes, because con con consultation takes time, and it's the best way to bring people together yes. into different measures. That being said, Thank you because the work I've already started, uh, we are working with SCMM in terms of what we, we could implement. I'm not against it, but it will take some time because it's not something you do just like that without working a company citizens. Eco-fiscality is important, but it also uh, can be threatening. And it's how do we bring people together to make the right decision for the planet? All right, thank you. Since the pandemic began, the use of public transit has dropped. So the revenues. Meanwhile, we've all heard the complaints from motorists, cyclists, pedestrians. They all say it is impossible to get around the city. Alicia? Montreal streets were all but deserted at the height of the pandemic, but now, as drivers know, they're jammed again. And LaSalle resident Song Yang wants to know what each of you would do as mayor to change that. Hello. What concerns me the most is transportation. What do you say to the people who don't want to leave their cars at home and use public transportation instead? have 
Ms. Blount, you have one <laughs> minute. How do you convince Mr. Yang that he should be taking public transit? Yes, uh, I definitely want to convince Mr. Yang because the key to uh, all the traffic jam is definitely uh, using more of the uh, uh, public transit uh, options. But I do understand that depending where you live, I don't know if Mr. Yang lives in the downtown core or elsewhere on the island, if you're in Pierrefonds-Roxboro, Rivière-des-Prairies, if it takes you an hour and a half to get to school or downtown, it's too long. So that's why people are definitely using their cars. So we want, in the last four years, we have pushed the, the transportation mobility, uh, the agenda, sorry, very far and very strong because there has to be option, whatever is through the REM de l'Est, the REM de l'Ouest, uh, the uh, la, la, la Ligne Rose, pardon, the uh, from downtown to uh, La Chine, all these options needs to be available as fast as possible because it is not normal that on the city of Montreal we didn't build any new petrol stations since 20, for 25 years. Mr. Cadell, you have one minute. Well, the reality is that uh, there's a, a major problem of mobility in, in Montreal and now we are facing a deficit of uh, 62 million dollars at STM and they're looking to cut 30 percent of the services so it's tr clearly a mismanagement and uh, the responsibility is the city of Montreal because we are voting for the budget. So we will have to uh, change the, the way that it's managed to we'll take a look at STM. The blue line, please, uh, the blue line is not working. They, they are almost in tutelle. They had to change and the government of Quebec had to take over. So we need to, to finish that. We need to make sure that we can work on uh, the orange line and instead of creating some new other thing Yang. that four years ago we'll let down. And what well, would you say to Mr. Yang who wants to, who no, wants to know what I'm saying why? is this, is that we, we need to focus, but we need governance, we need leadership. And uh, it's feasible and we are able to do them. If we're doing that, they, they will have that capacity. But we need to bring back efficiency in the transport to make sure that people want to take it. Mr. Holmes. I think it's a collective responsibility to save the environment. Uh, so anyone at home and you want to take your car, understand that pollution costs on average $1.8 billion a year. The MTQ, Ministre des Transports du Québec, established that. It has an egregious impact on, on the lives and the health of, of Montrealers. We need to do a better job to connect uh, Le REM, which is coming, to existing metro lines, to bus lines, to Bixi, to ensure that we have a transportation system that's cohesive. Right now, there is a war on cars. People cannot get through throughout the city, and we need to do a better job to ensure that, regardless of the mode of transportation that you need, whether you're a senior or a family and you, Mr. you need Mr. a car. Holness, Mr. Yang asked this very specific question. He wants to know why convince me to take public transit is what he's saying yes because right now pollution costs 1.8 billion it costs a taxpayer money we are actually paying every time someone uses their car and by thinking about the environment we can ensure that it is also your responsibility to save the environment take public transportation however we need a system okay, that is functional much, and that's Holness. cohesive we're going to open it up to a debate now and any Montrealer knows, whether by bus, by car, by bicycle, it feels like there are detours, traffic jams everywhere. It feels like it's been going on forever. We keep getting told it's going to get better, but when? Is this something, you know, Montrealers talk about traffic, they shrug, they roll their eyes. Is this something we should just resign ourselves to and say this, this is what, this is what life in Montreal is? Absolutely Mr. not. Mr. Holness, you start. Uh, um, in 2017, uh, the mayor, Valérie Plante said that she was going to de-block Montreal, and it got worse. We saw more cones, more traffic, elimination of parking spots, and we did not see the city thrive. Right now, the city is still locked up. We need a mayor that is going to actually remove the cones, and a mayor that's going to ensure that whether you use a car because you need it, or public transportation, that you are accepted and welcomed. And right now, unfortunately, the city is all locked up, and that was another campaign promise uh, that was broken, another sign of dishonesty by the mayor, and I think she should be honest and say that you broke your 2017 promise, whereby you established you were going to remove the cones and unlock Montreal, but you did the exact opposite. Okay, Ms. Plant, you'd like to respond to that? Oh, actually, I will respond to your question, but definitely when we think about uh, the uh, deficit of infrastructure, and actually on that uh, note, um, it was clear that Monsieur Cadet, when he was the mayor, decided to put forward this plan, 10 years plan, to uh, uh, 
um, you know, to do the work that was necessary. And it's not really sexy to do the underneath yeah. work. And on that note, when I took office, I decided to move, continue with Monsieur Coderre's agenda because I felt it was a responsible thing to do. Why I'm saying this? Because people sometimes, we need to remind ourselves why is there are so many orange cones. That being said, can we do better management of the cones? Absolutely. So when we decided to put a mobility, mobility squad, is to support that. When we know that there is also, for example, 25% of the orange cones belongs to the city of Montreal, 75% belongs to other companies or even private sites. And I think that we're happy to see all the construction happening in Montreal. It shows how the uh, the recovery, economic recovery, me, is going well. So I guess all I'm saying is here. we can do better, but they're necessary. First of all, for, let me take two things. First of all, there's a problem of mobility because we have also always a tendency, there's always fights between cyclists and, and cars. And uh, there's no, there's no anti-bike here, there's only one empty car and it's Projet Montréal. And in the way that uh, without consultation, I can talk to you about Camillien Oud, I can talk to you about the Terban bike path, when Peter McQueen removed 300 parking space without even a minute of public consultation, or the urban boulevard that we spoke about in Pierrefonds, another example of imposing the, the Projet Montréal ideology. So this is a problem by itself. We need a better coordination by having also, that's the second point, by having a better coordination with the engineers and, and try to stop to feed the, the, the beast by saying that, oh, this is not what I wanted, so let's, let's do it all again. And, uh, you know, it takes years in, in certain area where something had supposed to be a few months. And, and I find it quite particular that any time the mayor is challenged on a question, you deviate. In 2017, you said you were going to remove the cones, and then you deviated. The uh, Squad de Mobilité had 58,000 interactions. I spoke to them. They said that they were on their iPads just plugging in numbers. The Munch Montrealers do not see that this squad was actually benefiting. You speak about the pink line as if there was an inch built. And what I'm telling Montrealers is that can we have a mayor who is honest, who is going to stand up to the facts and take onus when there's failure. You did not remove the cones. So there what, is no pink line. You know what line. I find interesting is actually when you're uh, honest about uh, your job, you're able to adapt. So last year, uh, Montrealers, though they, they are agree that we need to do all the work, they agree with that. But at the same time, when they said enough is enough, that's where we decided to reduce by 40% the construction site that we controlled of the city of Montreal. And as for uh, the bike path, pink I am line. so proud. I am so proud that we move line. forward with no Saint-Denis because uh, Ensemble Montréal was against it. They said it was crazy idea. And now we're seeing a million people using the bike path. It was done properly. It took three years to do it properly with uh, our, our engineers or our public servants. And since it opened, not only is it safer for pedestrians, yeah. cyclists, and, and car drivers, but there's well, 30 know, new shops that open on no, you know, you know Saint-Lagé. I don't know, but I'm talking to a lot of people, and uh, there is a safety problem. We, we are okay with bike path because we had a, a, a velo strategy, a bike strategy, and even Velo Quebec was praising us. But the reality now is that during the pandemic, you impose a few things like that without consultation. Everybody is mad. It's always, uh, we're going to implement always the same path. And it's a problem by itself. I'm talking to the senior citizen who are saying, not only I don't have a, pl a place to park because you don't want to say how many parking space that you get rid of. But secondly, they are afraid because uh, it, it's always kind of a one way. So instead of just pushing for one group, it's, a, it's cool living that we have to I think that taking care of the most That's vulnerable so, is good for okay, everybody. But I'd like to follow up on, on, on what Mr. Carell <coughs> just said, because as we all know here in Montreal, so, so the, motors, uh, the motorists complain about the cyclists, cyclists complain about the motorists, the pedestrians complain about Walsh. everybody. <laughs> so whose fault is that? Whose it's, fault is that? Do we blame the construction? Do we blame bike paths? Do we blame people's behavior? No. So what can I we, do well, to stop yeah. this? Well, it was no. one, two. It was one, two. You so don't please. have to okay. put your hand to me like uh, this, Mr. Me. Holness. Oh, please, okay. we're... So right, right, now, right now, there is no cohesion between bike paths, buses, metros, and cars. It is a free-for-all. The mayor speaks about La Rue Saint-Denis as if it's the only street in Montreal. 
as if she's the mayor of Le Plateau. She forgot she's the mayor of all Montrealers, apparently. Right now, we need to ensure that there's more cohesion, and we are the only party that puts us forward, and thank you now that we have uh, 30 seconds, is that we want to ensure that anyone that has an electric bike that can go over 30 kilometers an hour must have a permit or a license. Right now, we have literally motorcycles, electric, on bike paths, zooming at over 30 kilometers an hour, and it's... Um, really a wreck and it's okay. a security but, crisis. But I guess it's, it's yeah. cohabitation is yes. what I'm yeah. trying to, yeah. to get to. Who do we blame the for only, this? The only party who's working for his activists is Projet Montréal. This is a dogmatic approach all the time. And the co-living is important. We need to protect the most vulnerable. That's why in 2016 we got in the, the, uh, zero vision, zero uh, accident, zero, zero death. And we, have, we need a better coordination. For God's sake, even Waze is lost now. So by doing, by doing so, if we have a, a common sense approach and instead of putting all the time the cyclists against the drivers at, uh, you know, uh, to, to fight, even the drivers are cyclists, but they're saying, I can't even go to bring my kids to the school. Okay. So what I find so very what sad right now, it's almost like uh, the, the, the Saint Denis, which, by the way, goes across five boroughs, just for your information. It's not just a cute thing to do. If it, there would have been, a, uh, if under your administration, if you would have done something uh, realistic on Saint Denis, Mathilde Blais, for example, would not have died. I'm not saying you're but, responsible. Yeah, you know All I'm saying is zero, vision a zero is not a only a slogan, but you that's answer your question. You just the thing is, the can I Kadar. answer the question around uh, why it is so? Because let's be realistic. The, the cities is done in a certain way. We cannot widen the street. There's always more cars. Numbers shows it. There's always more people in Montreal. And if we want to make sure that everybody's safe, yes, we need to share the roads. Okay, and it's not I, about I being anti-cars. Okay. It's about you're making you're sure people. that everybody is safe. I think Mr. Kodel has the right to respond to it. Oh, but I mean, about that, yeah. I mean you, you, you can't blame. That's easy. When you are without arguments, you're blaming the others. What I'm saying is this. That's why you've been doing That's since why, the no, beginning I'm, I'm of trying the debate, to, I'm trying Mr. To have a serious. I'm trying to have a serious discussion <sighs> on people are complaining right now. And there, yes, there are more accidents. Yes, there, uh, you promised the world and you deliver nothing because we saw you not just three months before the election because for three years and a half, nothing happened. And people lost that, that attractivity and people are leaving. What do you think the people are leaving people Montreal? People are dying it's on our streets as pedestrians and cyclists and you are saying that I should be okay. doing nothing. Well, I will always protect the most no, no, vulnerable. We, we this is our that. kids or elders walking down. No. I don't know when you're saying this. This is awful to saying, say that because I put security first, I will always, and that I can assure you everybody. First? Yes, as you notice, as, as you notice the, 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 the statistic about the incident of pedestri uh, pedestrian, yeah, because it's, you started rising. by lying that under my no, 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 mandate no. Oh, there was big, more big, big cyclists. Words. So no. now you're playing with words no, no. again. Look at the I find numbers this of very pedestrian. disgraceful. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Madame Plante. This is not, you know, dignity is also coming with the job of mayor. So let's all be digni the dignified. Well, don't lie about but numbers, Mr. No, no, no. We've got, there, you've got no, no, 15 no, no, seconds left. You get well, the last word. This is going to be a highlight this of is City very Hall. Sad. Either of them are elected. What we're seeing is that Montreal has four seasons. We need to do a better job to coordinate all levels of public transportation, of cars, of pedestrians, and that's how we're going to have a city that actually thrives, and that's fluent. Yep. Okay. Well, actually, we've just been told, I guess the people are enjoying you so much, we've been getting an extra minute to talk about this. One last question, and I'd like to ask all three of you. Winter's coming. I see sidewalks. What are you going to promise us that we're not going to fall this winter? And, and that's a great point. Um, I speak to businesses that say that we pay taxes, we are okay to pay taxes, but we want the job done. Right now, 28,000 employees at the city of Montreal represents 40% of our budget. Just get the job done, and that's something that we have not been able to do under this okay. these two current administrations. Well, the reality is that, you know, it, this is, uh, the, the, the election is about the record. And for the last four years, it's getting worse. But it's not just about icing, because we need to talk about universal access during winter, but even during summer. The sidewalks on, on Louis Bourg, for example, in Cartierville, you have several areas that, that's bad. So they didn't, they failed. They didn't do their job right. 
So we need to focus and we need to bring back, instead of cutting the $100 million for uh, local streets, we, need, we will bring it back and we'll have dedicated sun that we will fund and we will so, take care of the sidewalks. Yes, quickly, yeah. absolutely. Unlike so I'm very doing. glad of the uh, track record for the, the last winters. The fact that we brought a lot of new technology into uh, uh, snow removal, but particularly how we take the ice out, which is under every borough's responsibility, but we wanted to give them more tools, specific one to know exactly which route has been done and also to support the elders and uh, people with uh, uh, universal, universal accessibility issues, of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Merci. We're going to move on now. Deborah? All right, to the economy now. As it rebounds, inflation is soaring, and so are prices on just about everything. Already strapped for cash, many voters are bracing for another hit from the city. Here's Alicia with a question about taxes. The tax burden on Montrealers is already significant. Marsha Pourmand of NDG wants politicians to get creative. Hello, my top issue is the economy and cost of living. City of Montreal still uses the property taxes as a main source of revenue. So my question as a homeowner is how would you diversify the sources of revenue to limit the property taxes? Thank you, Ms. Pormont. Uh, candidates, you now have a minute each to answer the question. Mr. Coder, you are going to start us off and just remembering that uh, she is asking about revenue of streams. <laughs> we'll be focused. Clearly, we need to diversify our, our revenue. As we, we said earlier, we, the property tax is 76% of, of uh, our revenues, and in, in Toronto, it's 36%. So we need to diversify it. We need to look, take a look at the welcome tax that was supposed to be taken off by Projet Montréal. Now it's about 30% raise. We need to diversify and have a new strategic fiscality and uh, by, by reducing in certain area for the commerce. And uh, clearly we said at the beginning that uh, we won't raise up to 2% the, uh, the taxation. Projet Montréal said uh, inflation, and after I said 2%, they came back saying, oh, us, it's going to be 2% too. But what we need to do is to make sure that we're not spending like we're spending right now. Before pandemic, because pandemic, it won't, it won't be its fault, 20% of uh, raise of, of expenses, and now the budget's from 52 is uh, almost $7 billion. Thank you, Mr. Coder. Mr. Holness on revenue streams, please. Yes. Uh, right now, the budget is $6 billion. Um, and taxes represent $4 billion, services $2 billion, and that's a poor business model. We are the only party that's requesting city-state status to get more taxation powers. Our budget is $6 billion, but our GDP is $200 billion. Montreal is a metropolis and a thriving economy and a big contributor to not just Quebec's economy, but to Canada's economy. Right now, we are politically disenfranchised with the CAC. And economically, we are not getting our due. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. The $200 billion GDP that the city of Montreal has, that really that economic clout, we need to get a, a bigger percentage of that and have that economic downfall go into their pockets. Our budget should be more along the lines of $14 billion, not, not $6 billion. And I will pledge that we will fight for the city-state status and any elected official across any level of government, across any jurisdiction, will have to uphold and, and advocate for that thank if you, they Mr. want to be Hollis. elected thank on you. the island. Thank, thank you. you. Ms. Plant. Yes, thank you. Um, I definitely hear that, that concern. Uh, this is why we decided to freeze the taxes last year because of the pandemic. It was difficult for everybody. And though we uh, definitely, uh, and we wanted to contribute. So we, at the same time, we decided to cut into some of the uh, um, um, expenses within the city to also show good example on how we can uh, all participate to that big effort. So in the next, uh, the next four years, what we uh, have mentioned for tax is definitely that to keep at the uh, uh, level of inflation. And Mr. Kader, uh, just so you know, in our, uh, uh, at the beginning of the, uh, of the race with the uh, financial grid pre-electoral, we already said it was 2% for the first year. But ultimately, revenues are important. And the fact that we are having the best economic recovery in Canada, the second best in North America, is because people are coming here. And the more there's people that builds, that there is a project, that invest investor comes, the better it is for our economy. Okay, I just want to clarify before I continue on what people can expect for taxes because you brought them up. Uh, Mr. Cordaire, 2% uh, in the first mandate? 
Well, you know, our average when we were there was 1.8 percent, so uh, we're okay with 2 percent. But, but what the inflation we need to do, rate is at 4. No, the inflation 4 rate right now, now is at 5.1. But so, you have to look at the different indicators because we have uh, from uh, the, the city how they were talking about sometime metropolitan uh, uh, benchmarks, uh, inflation, and you have the overall in the province. So we have to take a look at it. But I said that with 2%, we will be able to, uh, to uh, make it happen. And you'll hold it 2%, Ms. Plant? Yeah, that's the, the point to start with. The f yes. Okay. Far more judicious, 3%. I want to remind all Montrealers the mayor lied in 2017, said she would not increase it above in inflation. She did, so, you know, fool me once. You Do know, you want to respond on. to that? Yeah. yeah, sure. The average of our, uh, the tax over our first spend aid is 1.7, and the inflation was 1.8. We're, we're speaking about the one, dishonesty the during the... inflation was at 1.2, and he went to 2.1. She's, she's attacking Kader. The dishonesty is what, during the 2017 election, you clearly said you were not going to increase taxes above inflation and the first thing you did is you increased taxes above inflation. No, which we didn't because... Oh, yes, Thank you. you. Did. Oh. And this is the lying that I hope that Montrealers see through this screen from the pink line to taxes Can to I the amount of social housing this? built. This is it is very this dishonest. Is so it's it's extremely attack. dishonest. Plunk, this is ahead. a debate where people want to hear about ideas. All you're saying, Mr. And even when yeah, there's a question we, we, about numbers, honest... you don't answer concretely. You just keep on attacking me. I can't defend myself. Don't worry. So all I'm saying is, during the first mandate, our goal was to be at inflation. When we took office, there was a gap between revenues and That's the expenses of $358 million. It's in the no, book, it's Mr. No, it's $174 Kader. million. So if we million had dollars, to find please. solution, and it was not a tax, but for sure, I understand that Montreal took it this way, and I apologize for that. So what we will be doing is continue, like we did during the mandate, we stay close okay. to the inflation. With all, with all respect, Madam respect, respect, Plan. Just what? for the record, if if, if a candidate for mayor establishes that you increased taxes above inflation, this should not be taken personal. This is simply okay, stating we're gonna, the we're numbers. Okay, we're going to move on. We're going to move on. The impact of the pandemic has been devastating for small businesses, neighborhood shops and restaurants. They're still in survival mode. We talk a lot about the relaunch of downtown Montreal, but what is your plan to bring neighborhood commercial districts back to life? We're going to open this up to a debate. Mr. Coderre, you can start this section. Well, economic development and Projet Montréal doesn't go together. And clearly what we need to do is we need to be uh, more attractive. We need to have some uh, strategic fiscality. We already put up in the first mandate the uh, non-residential -resident taxes from for 10 percent for one percent for for 10 years for one percent and now for example for the restaurants owner for uh, hotels for at the cultural level at the cultural level too we need we need to uh, find a better way to help them to come back because uh, with all the, the issues that they, they've been living they, they don't want to have fights they want to have ideas and they want to have hope so how can we manage it but we need to have people who can manage the city and right now the way that they expand it, it's a disaster Let's talk and we about need to some make sure. of those ideas though yeah. mr holness do you yeah. have an idea yeah for and us? i think it's, this is a great question uh at Moon montreal we want to decentralize our economy it's not just about downtown montreal what about la salle what about verdun what about montreal mm -hmm. north we want to ensure that, and i think we all agree on this is tax exemption zones to incentivize people to establish their small businesses in these areas. La Salle is a desert right now. They don't have access to transportation. They don't have uh, a lot of small businesses. The economy is not thriving. We want the 11 million tourists that come to Montreal every year to want to go to other boroughs, to want to go to, believe it or not, Montreal North, Saint Leonard. Saint Michel. We want to ensure that we decentralize our economy and all 19 boroughs can thrive. We need a mayor that is going to be responsible for all 19 boroughs, and that's something that we pledge to do with tax so rebates to establish because, businesses because on the, the periphery of the island. Because the question was about the downtown core, I'm sure no, we can no, talk wasn't. about the, the other not, about the, as well. So, no, the question uh, was the, the opposite. No, it was not we're about the downtown core. Is what, so our plan is to invest uh, massively into the uh, Congress Center because we're really proud of it. It's a great way to uh, fool our restaurants and hotels. 56% of, uh, of Congress right now from the international level comes to Montreal. I do. I just want to do yeah. re redirect you. You might not oh, okay. have understood my question. It, okay, it, was, go ahead. it was specifically about neighborhood commerces. Oh, just okay, so my, I apologize. Go ahead. Okay. I, yeah. I got it the yeah. other way around. No worries. So uh, because the, uh, the downtown core, I truly believe in it though because 
there's nothing to be scared of saying that um, the metropolis has a, a very strong downtown core. That being said, when we look at the ways we've been investing in local business streets like no one before, because we truly believe that moms and pop shops and people that are going into the neighborhood, especially during COVID, we need to invest in making those business streets more, uh, more interesting, that there's animation, we can close some of those streets. For example, Wellington is a great example of what can be done. Also, uh, what we did for uh, small businesses around terraces, making them almost free, those were really big incentive and I, I find it interesting that people here keep saying that Montreal is not going well but again numbers says no one said that, that but, uh, Montreal no is going very that. well and I'm proud because during the pandemic I was having weekly reality. meetings with all the ecosystem okay, to make sure that we would it's have an amazing the reality, uh, recovery plan. The reality is that it's easy to recuperate all those numbers when you're doing nothing. Thank you for Montreal International who did a tremendous job to bring investors but let's be more tangible the city is dirty right now. You want to attract people? Clean the place. This is a problem by itself. There is a situation with co-living, uh, and, and we need to, to help the, the, the people who are suffering right now because there is some situation on uh, several boroughs, as you mentioned. So we, get, we need to have some social sensitivity to help them to make sure that we have a proper environment for economy. So but, is the city uh, dirty? But to, and, and if I may, mm -hmm. just... We need to make sure that the city is not an irritant, but a catalyst. Because when you want to have permits, when you need to have some answer, it takes uh, some time, months before having it. So we, we are saying that there won't be wrong door. If you're asking, we have to be exemplary. Mr. Willis, uh, is yes. the city dirty? Is uh, that I, one I, area that we need to, to we, work on? We need to improve that, but I wouldn't go as far as to say this city is dirty. We do see a lot of garbage bins that are overflowing, and we don't see the same vibrancy and cleanliness that we once saw. But this is very, very important. We are the only party right now that's establishing that Ville-Marie should have its own mayor. The issues of the downtown car are a microcosm of the very problematic administration of Valérie Plante, where you have construction issues, businesses are closing, uh, dirty uh, and, and you know, garbage that are not picked up. We need to have, and we're going to negotiate this with the government of Quebec, that Ville-Marie must have its own mayor. Right now, the current status is that the mayor of Montreal is the mayor of Ville-Marie. We are the only party that's going to put this forward because Ville-Marie needs attention. Peter McGill needs attention. And we have to ensure that our downtown core for once and for all thrives. I'm the I only want, party want, who I lives want. in St. Marie. So I'll be the mayor of St. Marie because I live there too. It's I bought a I condo want, there 10 years ago. We don't so have, have a lot of time left for the economy. <laughs> I want to talk specifically about developers in the yeah. city. We only have a, a couple of minutes left for this section. And what I want to talk about is developers scooping up real estate in the city. And I'm talking about leaving storefronts empty and culturally important buildings empty. Ms. Plant, what would you do about that? So what we decided to do during COVID, because uh, though things really slowed down in terms of a lot of the, 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 the uh, you know, uh, project we had in mind, but we were able to hold this, uh, this Congress or uh, this, this platform around what needs to be done on Commercial Street. And this is why one of the things we've announced is that the City of Montreal will create an accès logis, but for uh, commerce, for, for uh, businesses, empty businesses that we could actually buy, support other uh, uh, business owners or SDC, so we can be part of the solution. The same way we're, we're being part now of the housing crisis, the city wants to be part of uh, revitalizing streets and buying some land. 40 seconds, the Mr. Part, the, the, to, to be part of the solution is to understand the developers and it's to make sure that we can work with all the economic partners so we, we are there to understand them and put up a frame where everybody can do their business. We need to requalify some of the buildings, of course, because uh, the, the working org organization is changing. But uh, we need to have people who understand economy and uh, have an entrepreneurial culture to uh, be more helpful to make this place shine again. Yeah, uh, the vacancies are very concerning because right now you have legitimate businesses that want to establish themselves that can't pay for it. So you have local businesses, it's really gentrification, are being priced out of the market. We are for a vacancy tax to ensure that we incentivize or actually push uh, promoters or building owners to actually rent out uh, their facilities, and right now they're simply not. All right, thank you very much, all of you. Montreal has a housing crisis. 
The cost of buying a home has become out of reach for most people. Rents are rising as well, and there's a serious shortage of affordable housing. Alicia? Deborah Fogel of NDG wants to know what can be done not only to increase the availability of social housing, but also to ensure its long-term viability for those who rely on it. Much has been said about the creation of new affordable housing. As both a board member and a resident of social housing, if the roof leaks after 20 years or the foundation develops cracks, we do not always have the funds to pay for these unexpected expenses and applying for funding from government agencies is often beyond the capacity of a volunteer board of directors. I would like to know what are your plans for the long-term funding and support for social housing. Thank you, Ms. Fogel. And we'll start with you, Mr. Holm, as you have one minute. So housing is at the core of the platform of Move It Montreal. Right now, there are 24,000 people waiting for social housing. Homelessness has doubled during the pandemic, and 28,000 people have left the island between 2019 and 2020. The current budget is around $140 million a year, and we depend on Quebec for our funding. We want to increase the current uh, funding for social housing from 2% every single year up until around 11% of the municipal budget. We also want to ensure that we close this massive loophole in the 2020 uh, bylaw, which uh, obliges people to, to build 20% social, affordable, and, and um, family housing. By closing the bylaw, you are going to ensure that we can get social housing on the island, and we want Le Grand Montréal to also adopt this bylaw so that promoters aren't incentivized to leave the island. Ms. Plant? Yeah, the question was actually about existing uh, funding, affordable housing, housing and how can we support these people that are already in a house and that needs renovation and to support them with their uh, for their with their board of directors and this is why we have put direct programs financial programs yes we did work with Canada uh, with uh, Canada and Quebec for that to get that money to renovate and to support the existing uh, parc immobilier it is so crucial to support the existing one but the question of a long term or you know a sustainable affordability is also major and for us buying land and supporting non-for-profit to actually buy those a build on it is crucial so we keep affordability not only for the next two years but the 14 years to come because right now the flips is a huge problem people get affordable housing and they flip it and then it's gone i want to stop that and this is why also the 2020 also supports all these tools supports sustainable affordable housing mr Kader. Well, we need to do a better job. There is agreement between Quebec and Canada, and we're not even at the table. So uh, we need to understand the system and show some leadership attached to it, and specifically with social housing, because you have with uh, the federal government also a national uh, housing strategy. There's a th $13 billion. So there's a several way to, to do it. First of all, we already have a status of metropolis where you have all the tools to work with regarding housing, renovation, and all that. Secondly, I would suggest that we would create uh, a, an impact investment fund for social housing. We would be ready to put $25 million a year, but uh, and, and invite the others like Caisse de Depot, like uh, Fonds Solidarité, and our private foundation who wants to focus on social housing. And on that level, we can put some, uh, how can we make sure that those uh, social housing will be there for, for long through renovation and all that. You know, you've all um, alluded to this, this idea of rent evictions, and there have been way too many reports of rent evictions in the city. And that's when people are being forced out of their homes so that landlords can renovate and then lease the, the apartments out at higher rents. Ms. Plant, how are you going to stop that? Yeah, so what we decided to do is to uh, have a bylaw within the boroughs that wants it. And right now, there's only the Projet Montréal boroughs that have moved with having a bylaw to protect uh, from rent eviction. It is not the case in the uh, Ensemble Montréal boroughs. And as well, uh, I do want to say that I find it very troubling that, Mr. Kada, you talk about leadership, about housing, knowing that your candidate as mayor of Verdun is actually a professional flippers. He contribute to take away some affordable housing for families and you say you have the leadership please this is not serious Mr. Kader? well I would suggest this uh, sometime also there's people who wants to renovate their house they can renovate it before the bylaws 
but I think that you have a lot of people who wants to renovate it. There's a difference between renovation and renovation. There's some young family who wants to remain in Montreal, but because it's too costly and because they can renovate, this is an issue by itself. And yes, this is the bylaws that some of your uh, people place in some of the, uh, of the boroughs. So we can make all those little uh, innuendos, but the reality is our role is to make sure that everybody will be able to get that, uh, that unit. And uh, right now, with the 2020, I mean, people are going to other places. We are just good for the suburbs. Mr. Holness? So right now, the rent evictions is a very difficult issue. We have companies internationally, also in Ontario, that are coming in, that are renovating existing apartments, evicting uh, local residents, and that's very problematic. The government of Quebec has to intervene. Right now, there are, uh, in the civil code, there are loopholes that allows for them to do this. Right now, kudos uh, to quelques uh, Proche Montréal boroughs that have this bylaw, but the provincial government has to intervene, amend the civil code, and that can close all the loopholes, and that for us is a major concern. And about that, I want to say we're the only party that actually is introducing a real rent registry, not a fake one like Mr. Cadin, which is voluntary. For us, it's mandatory because it is the best way to know exactly what's happening in the market and to make landlords accountable for rising prices very high if it's, yeah. if it's the case. Mm -hmm. There's amazing landlords around the island, but okay. we want to make sure that the ones that are not doing the, the, the right job or are putting yeah. away, sending away people, we're going to be after that. Ten seconds? Yeah. The question was about rent evictions, not rent registry. But to talk about rent registry for a moment, <gasps> um, right now for the last four years nothing was done. So to talk about it now, uh, in, during the election, it's uh, quite, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I guess, because, quite interesting. Because rent evictions aside, I mean, 60% of Montrealers are renters. Yeah. Yeah. The rents are going up, mm -hmm. and the families are leaving. So what are you going to do we about have a pro it? We, we have a program, and I think they've been doing that in Toronto and Vancouver, which is interesting. Because we spoke about gentrification. There is some issues we have to address. And uh, what I would suggest is that for the fixed revenue, the, the people will be able, if there's a, a raise of taxes, it, the, the difference, they will, we can put that aside and they will, they will sell, when they will sell the house eventually, we can pay the, 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 the extra at that time. It's been working tremendously well in Vancouver and in, in Toronto and I think that we will be able to do so. So there's a lot of people who want to stay at their home. And because of the, they only have fixed revenue, they cannot afford the raise of the yes. taxation. For uh, since the beginning of my mandate, housing always been a priority, and that's why we developed during our mandate a toolkit. So when we talk about the uh, renovation, we didn't wait. When we talk about the 2020, it's in the go. And uh, when we decided to increase the, the budget to actually buy land so we can build affordable and social housing, this is true. And now we're adding the rent registry. So I feel that Montreal's really know who really cares and who has been putting all the pieces together so we can create the, those 60,000 sustainable, affordable okay, now housing. I want to get to that, th those numbers again. Because yes. again, you know, I'm thinking about the people who are listening right now. You know, and we hear the big numbers being mm -hmm. thrown around. You know, we hear 30,000, 50,000, mm -hmm. 60,000. At the end of the day, a family needs one home yep. yeah. that is affordable, affordable, livable, where they can stay in the neighborhood they want to, mm -hmm. to live in. What are you going to do to help them stay there? So it's very important to note, we're in a housing crisis. Proje Montréal took three years and a half to put in the 2020-20 bylaw. So we were late to the ball game, step one. Step two, there is a massive gaping loophole that allows buyers to pay themselves out of this bylaw and that fee only represents one percent of the 24,000 people waiting for social housing. I would love for the mayor today to say she is going to close the loophole in this bylaw and also her definition of affordability. Our definition is 30 percent of your total income pre-tax. The okay. mayor's definition so, of affordability is? So in okay, terms so of affordability, don't answer affordable. the question. In terms sure. of affordability, the, the fact that um, when we decide to invest uh, the, the, the amount of money we're, we're planning on, is, and I'll, I, will, I will share the, the, the plan with you, is to actually to buy land. And from there, but we will uh, share it or we, we will borrow it to different organizations, even to the private sector. But the thing is, we will keep a tool. There will be a levier for us. So it stays affordable. I really want to put emphasis on that because in uh, cities like Toronto and Vancouver, 
where they didn't they just they decided to let the market go like you are planning on doing then they lost control and it's not okay. affordable anymore it better. has to be sustainable long-term affordability uh, you know the more i hear Madame Plant, and she sounds like a great leader of the opposition because nothing happened for four years. Nothing. And, uh, you know, what happened with Blue Bonnet, Ilo Voyageur, Hospitalier, Hotel Dieu, that was all social unit that we, we, we started, and uh, nothing happened. Uh, the reality is that uh, we, we talk a lot, but uh, why people are cynical, and you spoke about the numbers, in our case, we're seeing this. We want to work also with the private sector. We can have a regulation framework like smart regulation and uh, saying, and everybody will be accountable from the community to the, 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 the citizen, the private sector institution and the city. And we're saying 50,000 in four years because it's feasible. And on that, you will have 10,000 for social unit. Okay. The reality is that we need to make sure that when we provide a number, that we are able to, to fulfill it. Okay. When we no. talk about social unit, now we're just talking about a thousand out of twelve thousand okay. that the promise. another number I want to ask you and we've got we've got just about two minutes left mm -hmm. and I'd like okay. a very quick answer from all three of you at the CMHC says by the end of this year the average home in Montreal is going to be four hundred and seventy one thousand dollars most people can't afford that yeah. so is you know again people are leaving the island is home ownership in the city of Montreal a pipe dream well, should we I just forget about it it could be if we don't get involved. Again, this is why the 2020 is urgent. This is why it's necessary. I'm not going to give the key to developers without asking them to make sure that they contribute to this. And we have uh, made the, uh, the roof for, uh, for, to get a program for first buyers of a home. Originally, when we, uh, when we took office, it was about $250. Okay. Yeah. Now, yeah. we yeah. raised it to $600,000. Sure. Yeah. So. I just want to make sure that Mr. Kadeh and Mr. Holness get, get in. Do you want to sure. go first? Yeah. Um, if you vote for Project Montréal, it's guaranteed that the city of Montreal will not be affordable. There is a massive loophole in their bylaw. It speaks to the fact that Montreal is not affordable. 24,000 people waiting for social housing. You have to close this loophole and guarantee social, affordable, and we haven't spoken about this, but family homes. 28,000 people left the island. Do not listen to what the mayor is saying. Look at the record. Okay, Mr. Kader. There's two things we need to uh, prevent urban sprawl because that's, that's part also of the uh, environment-friendly process that we want to implement. There's density. We need, we need to rise, but uh, smoothly and, and smartly. And secondly, that welcome tax has an impact on the price itself. There's a lot of people who are saying that, you know, I want to have property access, but by, by having that, we, uh, we, we want to go outside. Okay. And well, so we need, we need to work on a better way. And uh, with the private sector and everybody, everybody should be part of the decision. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time on that topic. Thank you very much. In fact, we are out of time altogether. <laughs> it went by very, very quickly. That concludes the debate portion for tonight. Uh, you now have one minute for your, your closing statements. Mr. Coderre, we're going to start with you. You have one minute. Thank you. I came here tonight to tell you that another Montreal is possible. I want to deliver a message of hope and change. Together, we can build a safe and peaceful city where we can raise our children. A city that makes efficient snow removal, cleanliness, and pro proximity service a priority. A city where you, one can go downtown from Pierrefonds, Roxborough, or Côte des Neiges or La Salle without experiencing an hour of traffic. A beautiful city that creates li lively green environments and contribute to the fight against climate change. We have ambitious ideas and being responsible with your money. We can manage the budget properly, keep taxes under control, and build a better city all at once. You, des you deserve nothing less, because after all, this is your city. You do not work for us, we work for you. We will treat you with dignity and respect and make sure you have a place in, our, in your city. We will be your strongest allies and we will work with you rather than force our decisions onto you. Mr. The, en the Ensemble Montréal team Mr. is ready Coder. to get to work and I'm honored Thank to be you, running Mr. alongside Coder. many exceptional men mm -hmm. and women. Thank you. Mr. Holness. I will not be reading a statement. Uh, this is a defining moment. Montreal is a city that I was born in, a city that I love, a city that I'm raising my family. Montreal is a beautiful, global, international metropolis. But it's also home for many of us. I want to build a Montreal where you can feel at home, 
where you feel that you could raise your family, take your family to the park safely, get to work, use public transportation, and have a life that is joyful and fulfilling. A vote for Movement Montreal is a vote for change. I encourage you all to put the past behind and look to the future. Look to a party, Movement Montreal, that not just reflects you, but fights for you. Darnella and Bella, I love you. And everyone, please go vote for Movement Montreal on November 7th. Mr. Thank Thomas, you. Thank you. Ms. Plant. Oui, merci beaucoup. Um, I'm glad to be here um, doing the final statement. It's, um, it's an important moment for Montrealers because they have to decide who will be elected. And I want to say that this, this election also is a way to promote what we want for the future. What are the right decisions that need to be done now, but also for the future, the future generation? And definitely when I think about that, I think about the ecological transition. We need to do what is absolutely necessary, what the younger uh, generation are asking us to do. And we're the only party that takes that seriously and have been proving how, how uh, courageous we are. I also want to say that for us, people know who I am. They know our party. They know what we stand for. We stand for secure neighborhoods, strong communities. We want security for everybody, whoever you are, small, uh, elder, uh, families. Everybody needs to be safe. I also want to make sure that affordable housing is in, in, uh, in your mind when you will be go voting. And finally, the economic recovery. We've been doing a great job together. Thank you. You know who I am. Thank you, you very much. You can trust me, and I invite Thank you to you, go Ms. and vote. Plonk. Thank you all candidates. I want to pass it back over to Laura now. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Mitsumi. And thank you to all of you for uh, taking part. And of course, to all of you watching and listening at home. Now, it's over to you. It's time to have your say. There are two days of advanced polling this weekend in Montreal, and then two official voting days, November 6th and 7th. Don't forget to vote. I'm Laura Casella. Have a great night. Welcome to our City News viewers on digital. I'm Brittany Enriquez. The 2021 Montreal mayoral debate just ended, and what a 90 minutes it was. I'm joined by former town councillor and Concordia lecturer Bonnie Fagenbaum to help us break it all down. We'll also be going live to the Leonardo da Vinci Center in St. Leonard for reaction from the candidates. Bonnie, what stood out for you? Well, what actually stood out for me was I was surprised that Denis was so scripted, but then again, it led to a very calm and, and, and as he said, dignified manner. He did really look mayoral. Um, Madame Plante Valerie, I, I felt that she didn't stop taking shots. Uh, every time she could dig, there w it was right there. And Balarama, uh, he seemed honestly the most genuine and sincere. He was really talking to the people. But then again, I really didn't like the way he kept on calling Madame Plante a liar. I, I, I thought it was a, a not good form. Hmm. And was he right in any way uh, in, in calling Madame Plante a liar? So, yes, what he was referring to was in 2017, she said she wouldn't raise taxes, and then upon election, she raised the water taxes. So we're talking about, you know, skimping on words but the reality is when you get elected there are more there are re, there are financial new financial realities that you learn about when you take office that you might have not been aware of when you were running and i don't think it's it's fair to say that mm -hmm. and did anyone particularly surprise you in their performance tonight well, I, I really, I was so impressed with, with Denis. He was so calm and so, 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 so mature. So really, can, it, it felt like really he was trying to reconnect. And I like that. I like that. Mm. And of course, the most recent poll showing that uh, Valérie Plante and Denis Kadair are neck to neck, 36%, 36%. Um, do you think that either Denis or Valérie Plante performed enough to sort of get that edge? Uh, honestly, I don't. I don't. I, and I also think we have to look at those numbers a little more uh, clear, more fo more focused, uh, because 
when you look at them, only 62% of the people who responded on an online poll of 600 people, which means they self-selected to do that poll, only 62% are actually saying they're going to go vote. So what will make the difference for all three candidates is getting out the vote. Whosoever team has a better organization, they will be the ones that will make the difference. Mm. And of course now, you know, on the topics, uh, public security being a really big one, how did you feel they performed on that? Well, in public security, we had, you know, three different approaches. We had the three-prong approach from Madame Plante. We had the four-prong approach that we can do everything from Mayor Kader. But actually, a different, what I thought was a distinctive approach was Mouvement Montréal's, Valorama's approach. He, you know, I, you said I was a professor for Concordia, so I have to bring my real life in. And his Ba ba most of his platform is basically based on Maslow's hierarchy. Once we create security for everybody, then they will be able to develop and move up and self-actualize and, and learn more and be able to develop the economy that we have. Mm, for sure. And speaking of Balarama, for those who don't really know him or haven't really been following uh, the elections very closely, do you feel like viewers uh, might have been impressed by what he had to say tonight? I think so. I think he came off very well. I think he came off very strong, very compassionate, very in tune with the realities of Montrealers. Mm. And when it comes to public security, um, a very big topic both with Madame Plante and Kadair often going head to head speaking speaking about whether Montreal is secure or not. Um, what did you feel of their performance in that sort of debate? Well, I mean, when, I, when uh, Mr. Coderre talked about how people are afraid, to, parents are afraid to send their children to the park now, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I call, that's, that's really not a valid statement for today. Twenty years ago, as a young mother, I wouldn't have sent my kids to the park alone. So I don't think that has changed. Um, I do think that we, we, we his question about police presence, about defunding or, or putting more funding in, that's an issue for me because when we look, when he says we are underfunded and when we look at per capita, we are actually the most funded city in, if I believe, Canada. Uh, how are we using our funds? How efficacious are we in, using, in, in dealing with public security? And not just what Mr. Coderre is planning on doing, but what has Madame Plante done in the past to use the funds properly? Mm, for sure. And when it comes to housing, of course, there is a housing crisis in Montreal um, that is on the minds of many Montrealers and definitely will be uh, when it's going to come time to vote. Um, what did you feel about their debate within that topic? Well, I think they were all talking about the same thing. We need to develop more social housing. We need to develop more social housing. Everybody says that. My question is, the 2020-20 plan is that really financially viable? I, I can't do. I can't see the math on that. Um, my question about Holness saying that we needed to close the loophole. I don't necessarily agree with that as well. You can't always create. A, a developer does not always want to have a building that has all different types of housing in every different type of borough. Uh, Having a social housing bank, I think, is a wonderful idea. But my question always goes down to where are we doing it? Where is this vacant land that we are buying and putting the houses in? I haven't, where? That's my question. Mm. And, you know, when we think of housing, we, of course, will think about landlords and, you know, rent evictions. That was a topic that was also brought up. And what did you think of the way uh, they spoke about that? Well, I think that they're, it, 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 they're all sensitive to it, and everybody was willing to do something to stop rent evictions. Renovations to improve the area, that's a great idea, and it needs to be done to a lot of social housing units as well. Uh, one topic that I was surprised that didn't come up that Montreal can deal with directly is the Airbnb. B issues that are also taking away from the housing and the rents and the rentals that are out there as well. Mm, of course. And when it comes to inclusion, um, another very uh, big topic, uh, Balarama being, you know, it being on the top of his platform um, and, you know, calling out uh, Madame Valérie Plante on a lot of things. What did you think about? Well, I mean, he, 
he's the only one of the three candidates who can truly talk to it. It's his life experience. In the same way that in 2017, Valerie Plante was Wonder Woman and the whole city hall was transformed to a fem female, mother-friendly place, he will, if, if elected, he will be able to make that happen because it'll touch him. It'll really be his heart's work. And Danica Dyer, you know, saying that inclusion is a priority, do you feel like he was truthful in the sort of things that he was saying today? Well, debate? he does have a diverse team. I know that, I know uh, Lionel Perez, I know Alan de Sousa who work with him are, you know, are very reputable uh, members of the community and I don't think they would be standing with him if it wasn't true. Mm, absolutely. Now, when it comes to the climate crisis, of course, you know, a lot of promises here and there, you know, with Valérie Plante wanting to ban all single-use plastics, um, Danica Dyer seeming that, uh, I don't know if that's possible, the way that they were going back and forth. What did you think of that? Well, it's, it's, it's a, look, it, it's a business decision. It's a business problem. We allow the com commerce to design items for the dump. We allow them to create all of this packaging and then we as consumers and we as the general public have to deal with it. I would say that uh, we should turn these, these problems back to the companies that are making it. Hmm. And of course, you know, a lot of the climate crisis topics uh, kind of coincide with transportation, um, you know, overlapping a lot of talks of, uh, you know, they're needing a pink line, and of course, Valérie Plante, um, you know, bringing that uh, back up during the debate, um, a lot of talks about, um, you know, diverse forms of uh, transportation and mobility, and of course, Valérie Plante having a little bit uh, of a hard time convincing people that the um, the bike lanes were a good idea. How did you feel on, on that sort well, look, I, I personally, I'm at the John Molson School of Business, and I was really upset to not have any more parking near where I go to work because of all the bike lanes were there. Uh, I, I honestly think that some of the road rage and some of the mobility is because you're sitting in downtown, turning and turning and turning and trying to find a place to park, and you can't. And then you try to make a right, and there's a biker there. I'm a biker too, and I'll tell you, what bothers my husband and I the most on the bike paths are the walkers. Why are they walking there? Uh, I, I really agreed with what uh, Mr. Holmes was saying about the scooters and having electric bikes not necessarily being allowed to be on bike paths. I think that will do a lot for uh, calming things down, uh, especially when you're going uphill and you're chasing an electric bike. It's not, it's not easy. I, I really I think that there's a lot that needs to be done in allowing, uh, allowing for the fact that people come downtown in cars. If we don't allow them to come downtown in cars, how are they going to get home with all the stuff that we want them to buy? So I, I think that we need to rethink our, that Bathory Plant specifically, because she's the one who's pushing the more, most bike, um, I think we really need to think of fairness. Mm. We can't have the downtown surviving if we're only purchasing on bikes. And do you think um, that would be the downfall of Plant, um, the whole bike path situation? It seems like um, a lot of people uh, are unhappy with that, uh, especially drivers. Do you feel like that will hurt her? Oh, there's every single candidate has a has pros and cons. We said that the 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 e car valley was the downfall of Mr. Coder last time. Will the bike pass? I don't honestly. I can't answer that question. I don't know that answer. Mm. And of course, uh, during that uh, debate, Denis Coder basically um, saying that okay, well, you haven't really found um, you know any solutions to the issues uh, when it comes to uh, transportation and mobility and uh, Valérie Plante blaming it on Montreal and the way that it is created and that she cannot um, you know, large up uh, streets. What did you feel about that? Do okay, you feel like well, it's excuses? The, 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 yes, she, she is right to a certain degree that the size of the street is the size of the street and when they invented, made the streets that size, SUVs did not exist, okay? So yes, that's true. But on the other hand, if you're talking about coordination so that you don't have road rage and everywhere you turn, you know, there's an orange cone, it's, it, it requires coordination with all levels of government, with the private developers, that there are ramifications if a private developer just decides, which all of us have experienced, to close down a street because they have to back up or they have to have a delivery. There has to be ramifications and penalties when they do block the streets. 
if we, if the, the if all other, all three levels of the publics are in line and not Hydro Quebec rips up a street and then the City of Montreal comes back and rips up the straight same street, it will save money, be better for the environment, and cure traffic problems. Mm. And Balarama Wholeness speaking about decentralizing, you know, Montreal, that to stop focusing only on the downtown core and trying to attract tourists and other people to other boroughs such as La Salle, uh, Verdun, Montreal North, etc. What did you think about, uh, about that? I thought that was wonderful. I think that's a great idea. And it's coincidentally, that's what the Jazz Fest was trying to do with their sub-fests around the city right before COVID struck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for right. sure. That's a great idea. You can't just think of Montreal as that center city. It ha we're all 19 boroughs and the demerged suburbs are paying for it, so we all should get fr get something from it. Mm. And of course, economy, uh, the other topic uh, that was big there tonight. What did you think about their responses? Uh, well, the economy is it. it it's I, uh, what goodness. What can I say about that? It's. It's in the, it's a difficult situation right now. I mean, to say well, if we were talking about the economy in relation, let's say, to what Denis Conner was talking about, the STM being in in a deficit situation. Again, talk about fairness. That's not really a fair comment. It's in a deficit situation because downtown core has been shut. And that's what we have to really worry about, getting people back here in a responsible way. Uh, was, we, we, we'd been talking earlier about the XP Montreal. Did that actually bring people back into Montreal and spending money? I don't know the answer to that. We'll have to see the results of, the past, of this past summer to see if it, it actually worked. Of course. And there were talks about, you know, the pandemic um, affected many businesses, of course, um, and Balarama Wholeness um, talking about how Valérie Plante had lied again. He, you know, there was a lot of uh, back and forth with that. Valérie Plante um, talking about how, oh, well, there were, I think, 30 more businesses that were open on Saint-Denis. Saint -Denis. Oh, what did you think of that interaction there? Well, uh, when they were talking, what she was referring to how the bike path cre is a success, and it goes across five boroughs. She understands she's the mayor of all of Montreal. Um, my question is, what are we comparing it to? How many businesses were, were closed while all the construction was going? Did we, is it a net gain or a net loss of businesses on St. Denis? Mm. And do you feel that Wholeness has a solid plan to back up uh, all of his promises? Uh, I, he's, he's a newbie. Does he have a solid plan? He, he will have a lot of surprises when he actually sees the books. Everything that he's promising sounds amazing on paper, and I really, I, it, it, it's, the, it's, the, it's the new politician sure. ideology out there. Sometimes you can't do everything that you want. Yeah. That's unfortunate. And now we're going to hear um, from Valérie Blanc. So I believe that tonight I was uh, able to convince people about, you know, we are the real deal. We've been working so hard on, on these issues. We went through a COVID uh, together, and now we let's continue. How would you grade yourself tonight? Your performance, then, I guess. Oh, your, I'm not going to go with what's grades. Your, what's your takeaway message from tonight? What do you want people who are undecided at this right. point to know? I'd rather have people, go, you know, grade me. And I, I don't have the recul. I don't know how you say that, the, the kind of space for me to, I, I need to, uh, process everything but my message definitely is that we are the right team uh, for the job knowing that uh, yes we went through the pandemic together and we didn't leave anyone behind which shows a big a lot of leadership and that we care about people whoever they are and uh, we've been uh, building a toolkit for uh, to talk about uh, ha affordable housing for families the uh, middle class everything related to ecological transition we're ready we've put the toolbox together uh, transport uh, public security, our plan is so strong and well costed. People know where to stand. There's no, it's transparent, and I think people are attached to that. CBC. Paul well, Rommel, this says that there's been no action under your administration in terms of systemic racism. What's your response to that? You know, it's uh, it's always easy to criticize, uh, but if you look at the track record of everything we've been we've been able to do, whatever is the Compact de l'Ouest, having the best economic recovery in Canada, second best in North America, we went through a, a pandemic together, and like I said, we invested massively not to leave anyone behind or in the streets. It's it's when you think about it, we've done so much, and at the same time 
there are so many things we, we could have totally have dropped, but we didn't. And this toolkit about housing is crucial. There is no way we would be able now to go forward with 60,000 uh, long-term affordable housing if it wasn't for the, the toolkit, buying land, increasing the, the budget for housing, the 2020 bylaw, all these things were put together during our, our mandate. He also talks about the loophole in your 2020 right. plan. Um, what are your plans for that? What's your response to that? So what we, it's important to know, and in, in a debate like this, it's not always easy to go into details, but it's, there's no loophole. It's more the fact that uh, before uh, there was a, a housing strategy, uh, and before we, we, we decided to do a bylaw to the strategy was more like encouraging people and, and promoters to contribute, where for us, we said, we want in situ. So for example, in Ville Marie, uh, a promoter, if he, if he doesn't want to buy, build within his tower uh, some social housing, the amount he needs to pay is like tremendously higher. So it's a pensée si bien. And if he doesn't want to do it, then he has to build within one kilometer and buy a land and do it. So it is not a loophole. Of course, we're, we, uh, this bylaw was done with promoters. And, I, and as you know, they were already resisting at some level. But we came up with some compromises of making sure that with some bonus zoning, for example, in some areas, we can support them. But for sure, I'm extremely proud of this uh, bylaw. Uh, we took it to the OCPM because it is a serious matter. And we wanted to hear the promoters, the developers. But we also wanted to hear all the um, tenants uh, uh, right groups. Does that make sense? The way, yeah. So all that around the table. This is a very strong bylaw. Global news. Yeah, my colleague mentioned it. A recent poll shows that uh, anglophones, you know, are tending to go more with uh, Mr. Coder. But today, why do you think that anglophone Montrealers should choose you over anyone? Else? Um, first of all, because. I am, they know who I am, and I'm very transparent, and the way I will talk to them is exactly the same way I will, you know, I say the same thing east side of uh, St. Lawrence or west side of the main street. It's the exact same thing, and I'm not sure that Ikada can say the same thing. Uh, so whatever it's about, Bill uh, 26, whatever it's about housing, moms and pop shops and how I will support them, everything related to systemic racism, I, I have the same discourse because I want to be the mayor of everybody. I don't want to, you know, create false uh, uh, attempts or, or, or say different things so people have different expectations. They know where I stand and I respect every community and I've been a great ally during my mandate to Anglophone communities and this is why even though I'm, in, I'm campaigning, I went to the commission for Bill 96 saying we need to protect the rights of the Anglophone and the indigenous communities. That was a strong move. And asking that the 311 gets in the, in the list of uh, exceptions. So I, I, I really want Anglophone to understand that for me, the city is for everybody. I'm working for all of them. And again, I'm doing it in a very transparent way and I'm talking the same way to everybody so we, we can be a bigger, you know, so we work closer and I don't want to be divisive. Ah, ben, l'augmenter en fonction des besoins, mais ça a toujours été comme ça. So, as we just saw now, the questions uh, are in French. We're going to go back to you, Bonnie. What did you think about what she said? Well, I'd like to first address how she said that uh, Anglophones should, su should support her. And she says the same thing on both sides of Saint Laurent. Amazing that she says the, bo the same thing. But the reality is, she was the one who's going to hire Louise Harrell to promote French on the island of Montreal. Uh, I, I'm a kid of the 80s and 90s, and I remember Louise Harrell with not such fondness when it comes to Anglophone rights. So to me, that, that's a reason to not vote for Valerie Plant as an Anglophone. Okay, so her statement saying that she believes that she has been an ally to Anglophones, uh, is that incorrect? I can't, I don't know what she has done for Anglophones lately, but all I can tell you is hiring Madame Harrell sends a clear signal in my mind as a former Anglophone activist that something's going to, the pot is stirring mm. in Montreal. Mm, for sure. She did also mention that her plan is transparent. Uh, do you feel that it is? Sure. By hiring Louise Harrell, we absolutely know exactly where she's going. 
hundred percent. Of course. And what else stood out to you uh, when it comes to what she just said to reporters? Well, I, I agree with her that her numbers seem uh, succinct and that her plans are well thought out. I think that now that she has had the four years and has lived with the budget, she she with the numbers that she is presenting will be uh, will be valid. Mm, absolutely. Well, let's hope that we're going to be able to hear from Balarama and Denis Kader very soon. But to continue back on uh, the post debate analysis a little bit more, um, you know, tell me when it comes to Balarama. Um, of course, he has 12 percent right now. Uh, nothing like the 36 and 36 that the other candidates have. But you know, what role do you think uh, he's going to play in this election come November 7th? In other words, who is he going to be siphoning votes off in, from, you think? Um, well, look, uh, as far as from my opinion, and I want to just say that I'm a, I'm a, I live in a demerged suburb, so I cannot vote for the mayor of Montreal, uh, I, I feel the most connection to Valarama. I feel that he really as is really trying to f uh, live the spirit of the Montreal mosaic. That's the way we've always been. Uh, we've always been brought up is that we each will bring our individuality and our culture and our ethnics to make Montreal great. Um, I, but I also do very well know that it's a ticking time bomb to say that he's going to make Montreal a bilingual city. It will, as as much as for my own personal uh, benefit, I would love it to be that. I don't. I I, I know I'm going to get reamed for this, but I really don't think it's the right thing to do to uh, to join Mon to, for Montreal to remain a conducive part yeah. of Quebec. It yeah. will separate us way too much from the rest of Quebec, mm -hmm. and we already are a political island. For sure. Now we're going to hear again from Plante more English and questions from her. Their work. Because it's now a, a once man's work, it's an entire team. And I know a lot of those people, by the way. So they did the work and they came to City Hall saying, there's all this community behind us, people that wants to see you know, that moving. And I said, yes, I, we, there was the, uh, the process. And when it came out, I had a month to answer. It took me a week because I agreed with the process. I agreed with the requests and I was proud to be the first mayor saying, okay, let's tackle that. Let's, let's do what's there. And the three first recommendations were the, I, I said yes right away. So ultimately, leadership is about supporting other groups, whatever it's, you know, good ideas coming from the, the civic society. It's about moving it forward and being proud of bringing it forward. So I'm, I'm extremely happy about uh, the stand that the city of Montreal is taking on uh, systemic racism and discrimination. Okay. Merci. Uh, I think we have 10 minutes, so we're out of time. Thank you very much. For Merci beaucoup de <laughs> Great. And that was it for Plant. And now we're back. We'll talk a little bit more about Balarama. Do you feel like that 12% uh, will go up after his performance tonight? I think he did really well. I think I would I would be surprised if it didn't go up. Uh, I think he really connected with voters. I really think he is a, he, he's a lightning rod for the youth vote. And if he can really get that youth vote out, there, there, th th there's no telling how far he'll go. We usually don't see the youth vote co come out in municipal politics. So if he can really excite them to come out and, and make their mark. Who knows what will, we ha what, will, what will happen in a couple of weeks. Mm. And why do you think that is? Is it his approach uh, when it comes to certain topics, whether it be inclusion, um, public security? Why do you think he's kind of grabbing those young voters, if you will? I think his team is younger and more diverse. I think it's important to see yourself in the people that are representing you. And I think he's, he manages to have a whole wide variety of ages, genders, ethnicities, excuse me, around him. Mm, for sure. And how we, we just heard from Plant um, talking about, you know, systemic racism. And do you feel like Plant has done enough on that front during her administration? Well, she's very proud of being the first, the first, the first to have it on the books. But what have you done with the first? What are your new percentages? What is your new hiring? How are you dealing with it? Yes, it's wonderful you have the commission, but what are, what are the results so far? If she had results, wouldn't she have told us about them? 
Mm. So you believe that during the debate she was just throwing out a little bit of, I did this first, I did this first to justify the lack of... Right, and to be I fair, I mean, what was the instigation behind her being the first to have that commission? Balarama. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Now, Balarama has a lot to say on that front. Um, what did you think of his performance when uh, talking about inclusion and diversity? It, it was authentic. There's no, there's no two words about it. It was authentic because he he has lived it. He has lived. He has. I am sure. Racial, I, I mean, I don't know, and I'm sure uh, racial profiling has happened to him, even if he is a famous person and has been out there. Um, we've seen. We've seen. MPs who have had these things, these situations happening on Parliament. So when it touches you and speaks to you, you can definitely identify and really create a solution for it. And speaking of Balarama, we'll be able to hear him now. Et donc euh, en ce moment, euh, un peu d'explication. Euh, 40% de tout biais de contravention s'en va aux euh, itinérants. Et donc nous, ce qu'on veut faire, c'est que pour remédier les racines de l'enjeu, on veut s'assurer que les gens peuvent avoir un logement. Et donc, il y a au moins un 100 millions en ce moment qui, ont, qui sont dépensés dans les cadres et on veut faire en sorte que cet argent-là va pour assister la, 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 la racine des enjeux. Et donc, au lieu d'utiliser des ressources pour, euh, pour policer la pauvreté, mais on va utiliser ces ressources-là pour assister les gens dans la pauvreté. Et c'est pour ça qu'on dit que c'est une réallocation, parce qu'on adresse les mêmes enjeux, mais à leur racine. Well, you know, I guess uh, we'll find out on uh, November 8th, but I think that we brought a breath of fresh air to Montrealers. Uh, there is a new vision, a different vision, um, and I think that Coder and Plant uh, reflected the past, and we reflect uh, the future with, most notably, a, uh, a city that is multicultural, uh, that reflects the reality of all Montrealers, and with this idea that we need to do a better job at getting more money from this $200 billion budget, and most notably, um, that city-state uh, status that we've been advocating for. What would you say is your takeaway message from this message? From my, my takeaway message? To what you want people to take home from oh. That that uh, there's. It's time for change. We have seen what both administrations have done in the past, and I think it's time to look to the future, uh, a positive future, an inclusive future, and to build a city where everyone can thrive. Uh, you said during the debate your party is against Bill 21 and Bill 96. You follow that up saying that you will not. The law. Which law were you referring to? Both. So, so what we're saying is that we are going to ensure that, uh, let's take Bill 21, for example, that the rights of all Montrealers are respected. Uh, therefore, uh, in no way, shape, or form, first of all, the provincial government is not, can't enforce the law, but we will openly reject it. We will say that we do not view um, an unjust law as no law at all. So we will reject this idea of Bill 21. And in terms of Bill 96, we already said this, uh, the public consultation office, we want them to hold consultations to, to actually view the details of it. So the details, whether it's young people accessing SEJEPs, whether it's businesses being able to operate in both languages, we will not be advocating or supporting either of those bills. And it's clear that both Plant and Kader do support those bills. A lot of shots taken tonight. Um, I would say a lot of them by you, um, maybe more so than the other candidates. Why this strategy? Uh, can you give examples? I don't know. Uh, salary plant on the tax, uh, coming back to her track record a lot. Over yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's important. I think it's important for voters to understand um, who's being honest. And I think that over the last four years, whether it was the taxes, whether it was the amount of social housing units, uh, whether it was the pink line. I don't think that voters have a true sense of the record over the past four years. And I want them to give an opportunity to a party that's going to be honest, going to be transparent, has a vision for the future, and cannot be simply um, swayed 
through uh, things that have not occurred in a mandate to vote for that particular uh, party. I think that voters have the right to an honest, transparent uh, policy platform and for the records of all candidates to be um, laid out. And I think that if for us, it was important to ensure that you understand what the record is. So that's why we were um, adamant about being transparent with all the records of all candidates. If you look at the latest poll that just came out this morning, in terms of all the leaders, you are number one when it comes to defending Anglophone rights. Yet when it comes to the Anglophone community, you're not leading in that in, in the votes. But there it is. Yeah. Why do you think that is? What can you do over the next nine days to change that? Uh, that's a good question. So ang Anglophones, I believe, were at 14%. Allophones were at 21%, and I believe tonight Anglophones had a chance to see a uh, candidate that they have yet to see. Um, and we're going to see what the polls, uh, you know, what changes in the next few days. So, in terms of um, performance or in terms of the grade, you mentioned you want uh, someone went to a grade. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So, so in, in other words, um, all Montreals are going to be able to vote over the weekend as well. We are going to. Um, see what Montrealers have to say, particularly the Anglophone community, in regards to uh, the position on Bill 96 that we articulated today. Do you think your performance is strong enough tonight to change those numbers? 100%. We, we, we're going to see increases uh, in the polls over the next few days, and we're going to see the vote par anticipation that's going to come up in uh, the next few days. Um, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting the vote out. So what was it about your performance tonight that you think Will wow or wow? I, like I, to, to be honest, no, no one, um, no one wowed Montrealers. I, I think that it's not about a wow factor. Um, firstly, I think it's important to establish that. Let's just take, say, public security for example. Uh, we want to address the root cause of a lot of these issues, and I think that was particularly important for Montrealers to know that, in order for us to build a more compassionate and peaceful society, it is critical that we actually address the root cause of some of these injustices. And I think that is um, a significant divergence. In regards to, say, let's say the environment, right now the critical issue is that we have less green spaces in low-income neighborhoods, what we call territorial disparities. And I think we are the only party that's really pushing that forward. I think that's critical because there are so many boroughs on the perimeter that lack investment, that lack attention. Um, and that's something that we put forth, I think is a very, very positive. Also, I wouldn't underestimate uh, the city-state status. Right now, uh, we have a $6 billion budget. We established a budget is $200 billion. Can we get some economic uh, derivative and downfall from that uh, $200 billion budget? That we are clearly invoked. So there are clear, clear policies, I think, that we express today that all Montrealers uh, now know about and that they can uh, for sure get behind. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I, I didn't know you were together. No, but, no, no. I'm, I'm from Global East. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just jumped up. Okay, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, specifically Anglophones. Like, what, what did you think you brought to the table today? Something that they didn't know before about you. You know, today you clearly had a complete dominance of, of, of the language, at least. And you, it was your time to shine. Do you think you did that? And For sure. Was it that you to uh, Absolutely. So, so what we're doing is we're bringing a, a fresh vision for Montreal. We're, we're bringing a, a vision that is inclusive. Uh, we established very clearly uh, this is a multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic metropolis that um, everyone should be able to call home. And I think that's something that we reflected today. And I think that's something that all Montrealers can feel as though Anyone who wants to have equal opportunity, who wants to get a good paying job, who wants um, to uh, express themselves culturally, no matter what it is, no matter where you're from, you can thrive in Montreal. And that's, I think, we, put, uh, we brought forth today. Rapidement, il y a 33 recommandations en ce moment qui sont à l'OCPM. Et puis, c'est important pour nous. And we just heard from Balarama there. Now, speaking of anglophones, you just talked about that uh, in regards to Plant. Uh, do you feel that anglophones will vote for Balarama? Is he another party that anglophones might be going towards? I think so. I think that he's really 
piqued the interest of Anglophones after we've been introduced him tonight. I think what he just said, that we'll have to see how the polls turn out in the next couple of days, is supremely accurate. I think he came off extremely well, using words like, honestly, like every politician is using, we want honesty, we want transparency. That's the same. But what's different is his what his root approach. Mm -hmm. I really like that. It, it is, it, it's in the same way that we are now approaching health care by not by, by doing preventative medicine and thinking about exercise and eating right and, and not smoking. Yeah. I, he, he's doing the same approach to Montreal and I think that's great. We'll be able to hear a little bit more from Balarama with more English Over the questions. Next few days. Thank you. All right, so that's done. We'll talk a little bit more about Balarama. So, of course, as we were saying, um, you know, the Anglophone voters may be, um, you know, piqued the interest now of uh, Balarama. They might be, you know, interested by what he has to say. Uh, he did say that he felt that he spoke to them tonight. Do you feel that he spoke I to them? I really, tonight? I do. I really think that he spoke to Anglophones and say, and I really be I believe that out of the three, he's the one that will have our backs the most. That is, on the other hand, I will say that Denis Coderre is a federalist and he has the connections to help us as well. Okay. And as, you know, I'm Jewish, so we always have three hands. The third hand is, though, unfortunately, we are become, we, we are, we are uh, abandoned by all our politi all our, our politicians, mm. in my humble opinion, the Anglophone market at this point. Mm. And we have a viewer question uh, on our YouTube, uh, so I'll read that for you right now. This viewer says, is a vote for Balarama a vote for Plante or Coderre, as in giving one of them a lead, or is it more a message that it is against both of them? In my opinion, I believe it's a message that that, that voter wants change. That, vo that voter is not for Plant or Coderre, but for a new vision of Montreal. Mm. And he did say that. He said that Plant and Coderre are a reflection of the past and that Mouvement Montréal would be the future. Do you feel that he backed up his promises tonight? Uh, he, to promise to be the future, it's a very opaque promise. Uh, but, but who he has standing by his side is different. Is, does, they do have different life experiences, they do have different cultural backgrounds, and you know, in business we always say better decisions are made around the boardroom when you have a vast uh, divergence of opinions. So he does have that. Mm. And do you feel between the three candidates, uh, which um, one will Anglophone go for? Um, will they lean towards Kader, Balarama? We had talked about this earlier. Plante, maybe not. What, what are your thoughts? My my thought is that we will we, Anglophones will either go for the newbie or for the Federalist that has been by our side all these years. Mm. And is he right in being so confident with his performance? Uh, he said to reporters not long ago that he is certain that the numbers will go up for him after this. I, I, in the Anglophone market, I would tend to agree. I think he came off really, really well, mm. really personable, and really the way he spoke to the camera, he was really speaking to the voter. Mm. Absolutely. Now, back to what we were talking about when it comes to economy. Um, yes. I know that you had a lot of points that you wanted to speak about. Let me go about back to in, my notes then. <laughs> in, in, in that topic specifically, uh, what did you feel really stood out when it comes to that topic in their debate? Well, what were they talking about mostly when it comes to the economy? I'm sorry, I've lost my notes. Give me one moment to oh, refine my Oh, no, it's no problem at all. Of course, they were talking about taxes, and Balarama did mention, oh, well, Valerie ended yes. up so what did you think about that? Is he right in saying that? Well, we were talking about the, the water taxes, but like I, like I said earlier, there are realities to a budget that you don't necessarily know until you take office. And that's the unfortunate truth. So I think we're, she is, is just you know splitting hairs on the words. She didn't raise the property taxes, she raised the water taxes. Is she a liar? Uh, it's semantics. It's semantics, and in politics, sometimes it always it comes down to semantics. Would I have used that uh, charge language as if I was in Valorama's shoes? No, I would not have. Like, but 
then we have to create those sound bites, mm. sound bites for us. So <laughs> wire is good. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> now we're going to hear more from Kader. That's for sure. And uh, <clears throat> a vote for uh, Balarama is a vote for Valérie Plante. So, uh, and uh, there's a majority of people who wants, uh, who wants uh, some change. So I think that uh, we, we just show that we are pragmatic, that uh, we have the experience. Clearly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the candidate for that change. In 2013, when we came back, we had to make sure that Montreal was relevant again. We, we are facing the main problem with other purposes. But I think that we, are, we have the team, we have the experience, and, uh, you know, we cannot afford another, another experience like this. But uh, clearly, after uh, all I've been hearing, uh, Sorry, but Montreal, Montrealers deserves better. And I think with Ensemble Montreal, we can make it happen. Why are you the candidate for change? You've been in power before. So what are you telling Montrealers tonight after this debate that they should vote for Well, because first of all, uh, how to manage the taxpayer money. We, uh, we, we raise uh, the, the, the credit rate. We are at the, at the burden of a blow. Uh, because of, of, of that, uh, there's a, it's less safe. It's in Montreal. We we need to have the, the that expertise to uh, bring back uh, the economy downtown. Uh, you know, we're, I'm not. I wasn't there just the last three months when I was mayor. I was there full time all the time, and uh, it seems uh, I, I, I witness a lot of unicorns from Projet Montreal. And uh, I don't know the way that uh, they've been spending, but now if you look at all the promises, she, she, she sounds like the leader of the opposition. And clearly, people are afraid because uh, not only really afraid, but secondly, uh, we're not relevant again. Uh, we, we are in housing in competition with Kandiak, Laval, and the others. We, uh, we are, uh, you know, talking against the private sector, and now we try to use them. I mean. I am the only leader who can bring everybody together, and because we have a tremendous team to do so. And uh, that's a very fair and, and important question for me because I say, okay, let's compare both records. Economically, uh, you know, uh, it seems like Montreal didn't exist before 2017. I mean, uh, Jeanne Mance, at one point, she will say that she's the true founders of Montreal, because if not, it's going to be people from uh, Projet Montréal. So, you see, uh, people are fed up. There's pandemic. We don't, we don't want to have personal attacks. What we are looking for is a plan. We need to bring back expertise, experience, and assurance. And right now, we don't have that. How would you um, rate yourself tonight following the debate? I, I felt good. Of course, it's not my mother tongue. I was not looking too much for words. But uh, look at public safety when we talk about economy, when we spoke about mobility or the non-mobility. Uh, I just wanted to, you know, and I wasn't at that level of personal attacks because I'm not running against uh, Balarama or, or Valerie Plante. I'm, I'm running for Montreal. And that's the most important thing. And people deserve better. So we provide, we provide uh, all the, the, the plan. And uh, I pass uh, my message. Sometimes it was a bit uh, maybe tougher because I was looking for certain words. But uh, the bottom line is that I feel good. Balarama Holness criticized the lack of action on systemic racism. Say that again. Balarama Holness, he criticized a lack of action on systemic racism. What's your... Well, I, I congratulate him. I even wrote it in my book. I mean, uh, you know, he, he, Balarama did, did good, but as I said, the vote for Balarama is a vote for Valérie Plan. So, but uh, it's an ongoing issue. We recognize uh, uh, racial profiling. We, we put up the four pillars for public safety where we will make sure that there's training, more sensitive approach, but it's not uh, one on one side and the other on the other side. We should all work together. So, and that, that was important because we spoke about inclusion at that point, right? So to be inclusive means that uh, the police force is important. They are also social actors, but we need to have the communities uh, uh, group, the community group, so we can find out ways, a better training, and I propose all that in our in our in our plan. We we have a we have a plan where we can manage the shortage, but at the same time we have that uh, ecosystem to address those issues. At the same time, we will have to do our job regarding representativity 
because we're talking about jobs, we're talking about housing, and address it right now and working in prevention. That's why the, 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 my concept of living together is the balanced approach between openness and vigilance. We recognize the issue, we're protecting our values, but at the same time, you need that vigilance to make sure that you're not just there to react to something that you're preparing the field. We can talk about education, we can talk about the kids, we can talk about citizenship, and, and making sure that at every level we are taking the right decision together to uh, prevent those issues. Okay? I'm wondering where you go now in the campaign. With well, I'm going now, I'm going home afterwards. <laughs> I will do exactly the same thing. We're not taking things for granted. I feel great. We have a tremendous team. It's my 12th campaign, but every campaign is different. And, and uh, I, I'm visiting three or four boroughs per day. Uh, I'm just, my energy is connecting with people. And uh, I saw all that enthusiasm of, of, of the, 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 the team. I was going to say kid, the team. And uh, because I was looking at Adrien's, <laughs> Adrien's my kid, but uh, it's fun. We need to have fun. But uh, we are at the crossroad. We're not just preparing the next election. We're preparing the next generation. And you have our seniors who are suffering. There's issues of, of, of uh, safety, but it's also about service delivery, services delivery. So the core business is as important. And, and you know, it, it's easy to say, oh, economically it's going well because we had $3 billion of investment. Well, guess what? It's not because of the city, thanks to Montreal International and the others. Imagine when we were there, when we will put everybody together, you know, the catalyst. Yes, hello. Hello. <laughs> My colleague mentioned the poll that just came yep. out, and it seems like you have uh, Anglophones vote. So if they come out and vote for you, what are you going to do concretely in order to make them feel uh, welcome in Montreal? Oh, providing services, making sure that's our duty. This is our, we are the closest government and our role is for safety, the 311, uh, everything regarding uh, housing, the dwelling, you know, the, the pro there's some major problem at that level, uh, healthcare. Everything based on the residence agenda, we have to be there. And, uh, you know, the, we're already doing that. I mean, uh, Lionel Perez in, in, in DG Côte des Neiges is doing it, Jim Bays uh, in uh, Pierrefonds, Roxborough, and Cartierville uh, on six, same thing everywhere. So sometime it's, we, we are doing, we're do, making a bad, we're doing a bad job to delivering the services. So when we need to be there to deliver permits, when we'll be there to inform the population, and, but we've been implementing that before when I, I put up together the, uh, the resilience agenda. When we were working with the Rockefeller Foundation, we were one of the 100 cities in the world that put up that, that, that thing. We need to do a better job because uh, people are calling and uh, they are throwing in every other places. So we will do our job. We will make sure that uh, we will be there to make a, a safer Montreal, a cleaner Montreal, and uh, be uh, exemplaire to provide the services. And how are you planning to provide those services while balancing Oh, we have experience at that level, and we've been already working on a plan. It's in on, on our platform. We have the people for it. We we need to, you know, we need to get rid of all those red tapes and silos. While balancing, again? While balancing Bill 962, how do you plan to deliver those? Oh, I said, listen, it's the applicability. It's a matter of applicability. There's already exemption on 311. Did you know it? No, they're it. That's it. I'm a, but uh, when you call the, for 311 or 911, it's about safety, and uh, there's many of those issues is about safety or some specific health and all that, and we already address it. So it's a matter of common sense, and I will always be there. I was, you know, in politics for all those years, and I was always there to uh, make sure that uh, everybody feel great, and uh, I, will, I will continue to do so. That's it. Félix. Ça serait quoi vos solutions pour lutter contre les problématiques de racisme systémique? J'ai rien compris là. Excuse-moi. So we just heard from Denis Coderre here a lot of pointers over here. Now, first thing that I want to ask you, he said that he's going to be the leader that's going to bring everyone together. What are your thoughts? Uh, Denis, he, he said it himself. It's his 12th camp campaign. He is a consummate lifetime politician. He knows people in every, on every level of government. I mean, I personally have known Denis for a, at least a decade. Uh, People, as long as he keeps his ego in check, 
then yeah, I do believe he can bring people around the table. People like Denis. They respond to him. They, he knows how to have fun, and he's a hands-on guy. I mean, I remember it, when, he was, when he was the mayor, his little going to check the water mains in his minion outfit. That was, that was a, a picture for the books. So he does, he really does try to implicate himself. Uh, Lionel Perez, Jim Baez, Alan D'Souza, he's recruited Sonny Moroz to replace Marvin Rotran. Uh, Sonny and I worked together in Anthony Housefather's office, a great addition to the team. I, I, I think that he is right when he says he, he is a unifier. Mm. And he keeps on speaking about having experience. He has experience. You said he did. Uh, he did lose to Plante. Um, yes. Now, do Montrealers, do you think that Montrealers are going to feel that his rebranding is genuine this time around, those who voted against him? Less weight, less ego. We'll hope that that's what, uh, what we have. Look, it, it, to put yourself out there, to put your name on a ballot, to want to serve, you don't do that just on a lark. You really, it really takes a lot of thought. And to want to commit yourself to that level of community service, your heart has to be in it. So I, I believe that, that he is doing it for the right reasons. Mm. And do you feel that Montrealers got the answers that they were looking for tonight? I think that we were able to hear a lot more thoughtful talk and debate and platform and policies than we were in the previous debate, so I applaud the moderators for that. Uh, I think most of the answers we've got, I think, I think Montrealers, especially Anglophones, have a good idea of who we could support mm. on November and 7th. What would be your final thoughts about this debate and how they performed? My, uh, it was entertaining television. <laughs> Yeah, that's for sure. So let's hope that uh, Montrealers will have the answers that they uh, wanted and were looking for and will be informed to vote on November 7th, of course. Uh, first, you know, thank you so much, Bonnie. And thank you all for joining us. This post-debate show advanced polling is this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, 9.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. You can check out elections.montreal.ca for young your polling stations. And then November 6th and 7th, 7th, 9.30 a.m. to 8 p.m. Our final days to cast your ballots. We'll find out who's next mayor of Montreal on November 7th. Follow City News Montreal digital platforms for all your election coverage and tune in to our broadcast at 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. for more. We'll have a full wrap-up for you tonight at 11 p.m. on City TV. Thanks for watching. Good night.